Hello and welcome to the first meeting of our course. Um, this is uh, this course is called Emergency Government: The Political Theory of Decisionism, and um, <clears throat> we're going to be meeting every uh, uh, Sunday and Wednesday night for the next two weeks. Um, or not every, but for the next two weeks. Uh, and uh, in this course, we're going to be um, looking at uh, the question of decisionism, the question of how decisions are made how um, social and political thought has handled that question um, in various traditions and uh, uh, I'll go over the syllabus in a little bit but um, uh, first I'll just introduce myself and I thought that we could maybe um, give introductions to each other. Oh there's Brian. Hey Brian. Hey. <laughs> uh, so I I'm posting, uh, I'm, I'm just going to post this one more time since Brian's here so he can see it too. Um, in the right hand side of the chat you'll see um, an overview of the class and so basically what I thought we could do first is just um, introductions kind of go around and uh, <clears throat> introduce ourselves and then after that I'll do a kind of proper introduction to the course um, then I'll, I'll share my screen and we'll do an introduction to the syllabus uh, and we'll kind of divvy up readings to, to um, process together um, over the next two weeks and, uh, and then and then we'll maybe take a short break and come back and um, do this actual class session. And uh, the only, you know, be kind of a close reading of Schmitt's um, Counter-Revolutionary Philosophy of the State, uh, which is the last chapter of political theology, um, and kind of have a discussion based on that. So, uh, and then we'll close it out with just a preview of what we're going to do on Wednesday, and then we'll, then we'll close it out. So um, I'll start with myself, and then we can just go around. If you want to just say, uh, um, so basically just say like your name, uh, kind of your, your your general background in political thought. Um, I, I assume that we all have. Uh, I assume that we all have some background in. Um, I assume that we all have some background in philosophy in general uh, and critical theory and things like that. But what I mean by political thought is uh, kind of like what people think of when they think of political theory per se. Um, so, so, and uh, yeah, so just uh, your name, your kind of general background in political philosophy, and then why you're interested in this class in particular. So I'll start with myself. Uh, my name is Jason Adams. I'm uh, PH, I have a PhD in political science from the University of Hawaii, and uh, my background in, in um, political science uh, was mostly in political theory uh, and kind of at the intersection of political theory and, and cultural studies, um, and, uh, and obviously critical theory and continental philosophy and all of that, but really within that it was, it was basically political theory. And I worked for five years as um, managing editor of Theory and Event, which is kind of one of the one of the uh, journals that 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 is about theory, that is about you know politics and things like that, but it, it really almost everybody who contributes to it comes from um, political theory in some way, uh, from the political theory tradition, even if they're totally you know uh, you know pushing it to the side or critiquing it or whatever they're doing to it. Um, and then I have another PhD in media communication from European Graduate School where I studied with Giorgio Agamben. I actually went there specifically to study with Agamben. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure I'm the only person in my cohort who went there to study with Agamben. Everybody else was there for Zizek and Baidu and uh, other people like that, which is totally understandable, but um, I really liked Agamben. And, uh, and then I was also there for Paul Virilio. Um, so that's, that's kind of my background. Uh, my interest in this class, in creating this class and, and teaching this class is um, is basically rooted in all of that, but I've always been, I guess a lot of my background is in anarchism, and I, uh, after 2008, and uh, especially after hitting the horrible job market right after that when I graduated, uh, I took a turn towards uh, Marxism. <laughs> Secret theologian, yes. Um, I took a turn towards uh, Marx and Marxism. Uh, I taught a class at Williams College on, on Marx that was called Marx Beyond Marxism. Um, and ever since then, I've always felt much closer to Marxism than, than anarchism. But, um, but I still have that in my background. And Carl Schmitt and Agamben uh, really kind of encapsulate those types of interests that I have had historically. Um, 
and uh, so this question of how decisions are made has always been pretty central to to what I do, to what I've done and what I've researched. Um, and uh, and then the other thing is just uh, you know in Michigan emergency government um, you know emergency managers that have taken over like half of the cities in the in the state that I live in. Um, uh, things like in Ferguson the the calling in of the National Guard and that kind of thing. But you know I'll, I'll go over those things in more detail when we go over the syllabus. But um, I'll just pass it on now. And uh, actually, I thought maybe we could start with Bruce Demidici. Um, Bruce is a, uh, I'll just say just a little bit about him, and then he can introduce himself. Um, Bruce is a, a lawyer in Chicago and uh, uh, very interested in critical theory, um, has, a, has some background in, in, in Marxist thought, um, and then also in post-structuralism uh, in a variety of different fields. And um, so we had talked originally about kind of co-teaching this class, but I think that what we're, what we're talking about now is uh, uh, possibly doing a, a kind of follow-up class that would be more about kind of um, like actual cases uh, in, in which emergency government has been enacted um, in recent history, including the present right now. Um, and uh, so, but, and, and Bruce will be a, a officially be a guest in, in, in the course, um, I believe, next week. So I'll just turn it over to Bruce, and, and he can introduce himself, and then we'll just keep going around, and, and people can introduce themselves. Uh, I don't have a lot to add to what uh, to what's already been said. Uh, Jason did a good job of introducing that, and uh, um, Jason and I have had many discussions about an interest that I have in Schmidt. And um, apropos, uh, I, I learned about Schmidt when I was reading a Gambin, so it's it's just a it's a nice poetic segue with uh, with Jason's comments. But I did earn my undergrad in philosophy uh, many decades ago, and then went on to law school. And I, and the focus of my practice that's really at all germane to this class is that I do uh, bankruptcy work, and so uh, many interesting discussions about just how the uh, the financial state of affairs of these Michigan cities segued into bankruptcy filings and the sort of uh, extra constitutional considerations to those. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this class. I, I find Schmidt very, very intriguing and notwithstanding his, uh, let's face it, highly controversial history, it's my point of view that you do need to consider uh, Schmidt's considerations in a lot of contemporary events and, and I think that this course is very timely. Thank you. Okay, um, maybe Aaron next? Sure. Um, my background is not quite so extensive, but um, in um, undergrad, maybe, actually... Maybe I'll also say, like, like where you are right now, um, like where you're living right now and that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, so I'm Aaron for everyone. I'm living in New York City at the moment, and um, my, my work as an undergraduate actually did focus a little bit Quite extensively on Schmidt and and sort of this tradition of political philosophy, actually by engaging with sort of what I considered its opposite, which was crowds, crowd theory, sort of ungovernable bodies, and uh, sort of attempts at at managing those scientifically and conceptually. So it's sort of interesting then to to look back on on the other side of that kind of divide. Okay. And and what kind of uh, I know you already said it, but just for the sake of the archive, um, could you say just a little bit of, about about your background in I guess political thought and other things like that? You went to Wesleyan. I went to right? Wesleyan and I studied uh, mostly modern European history, a little bit of philosophy and and German studies. So. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, maybe Brian. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I just, uh, I uh, studied philosophy from undergraduate, and um, in just the year and a half after that, I've been uh, kind of feeling around in different different fields, have uh, been studying a lot of classical pragmatism, have been um, sort of active as an activist in uh, food agricultural stuff in uh in and around Grand Rapids, so kind of where I'm coming at it from. Okay. 
Great. And um, did you? I know, I know you have a lot of background in philosophy in general, but did you did you study um, uh, did you study any like political theory or political philosophy in particular in your undergrad? No. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, how about uh, Carlos? Sorry, I'm here. My uh, this is my day off, and my kid is is uh, trying to uh, get into political theory by means of taking <laughs> off my hat. Um, actually, I'm a I'm a assistant professor of Spanish and cultural studies at Michigan Tech University. I'm Carlos Amador uh, here in Houghton, Michigan, which um, Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It's just slightly economically better than the rest of Michigan. Primarily because there's not as many people to suffer the emergency that downstate does. Um, my uh, dissertation is actually on intersections between Badiou, Hall, Word, and uh, political re rhetoric and discourse in the Dirty War period in Argentina. I'm a Latin Americanist by training, but um, my master's in philosophy and critical theories and political theories endemic to what I do. So. Right. Um, I've respected Jason for a long time, both as an editor through an event and in his uh, connections with some really great thinkers and workers. I'm just glad to be here. Like I said, uh, I'll do some homework, but this one is a little more passive for me because uh, just of the scheduling. And uh, But I took the first one on accelerationism, which was tremendous, and I can't, uh, can't thank Tony and Mo and Jason enough for putting this together, and I apologize for people having to see my multiple chins, but uh, <laughs> it's it's Sunday, and I figured the most uh, politically uh, autonomous gesture I could make was to lay down and enjoy myself while I listened and uh, contributed um, somewhat less actively. So thank you guys for being here, and thanks, Jason, again. Yeah. Well, I, I actually did a few things uh, with the syllabus in terms of readings and um, the, just the way it was structured to try to, to try to take into account the accelerationism seminar and to try to kind of build on that because uh, <clears throat> I'll bring this up when we get into the syllabus a little more, but um, people may know that there are two that there are really two kind of tracks within accelerationism. There's there's sort of left accelerationism and then there's right accelerationism and the right accelerationists. Uh, I've discovered recently, I mean, I kind of already knew this, but um, I didn't realize quite to what extent, uh, really, I think, arguably are uh, well described as, as decisionists in Carl Schmidt's sense. Um, and the, the argument that you hear from people like Nick Land uh, and um, this guy, uh, Mencius Moldbug, uh, who, who is another figure in that uh, right-wing version of accelerationism, um, is you know their, their their rhetoric is basically talking about uh, reaction uh, neo reaction and uh, you know the, the the reactionary the history of reactionary thought is all basically what we're reading today it's Donoso Cortez De Maestra um, and these other figures and except what they want to do is they want they basically want a capitalist monarchy and they call it neo cameralism but we'll, we'll get into that later on uh, but uh, but they are talking about exactly these ideas. So hopefully that'll be an interesting follow-up. And we will be reading Moldbug and, uh, and a Nick Land text um, towards the end. All right, so um, how about uh, Harry? OK, let me unmute first. Can you hear me? Yeah. I uh, currently live in Elko, Nevada, which is a mining community midway between um, Salt Lake City and Reno, Nevada on I-80. Uh, <clears throat> I worked a, uh, with the mining community here. We have large international gold corporations, and these are some of the largest gold mines in the uh, continental United States. So my interest is in worker health and safety. I'm a physician uh, trained at uh, Brown University with my MD, have a, a, uh, uh, my residency training in uh, 
uh, occupational and environmental medicine through the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, my part of my interest in the new center is that it is a uh, 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 a new means of education because part of my residency training in place and through telephone conferences, tele teleconferences, as well as uh, uh, on-site uh, meeting in Philadelphia. So this is this is a type of educational model I'm very, very, very interested and very committed to. Uh, because I, I, I think that with technology as it is now and with the diversity of trained people who are very competent available to give courses like this, I think this is, this is a very good solution to, to people who are interested in active. I also have a PhD in pharmacology and toxicology from The Ohio State University and a Master of Public Health through the University of Texas Health Science Center, uh, trained as an epidemiologist in, in that particular area, as well as uh, interested in emergency response, hence my interest in this particular seminar, because uh, uh, here in Nevada I am the local county health officer of uh, uh, a great deal of um, uh, 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 let, shall we say police power in terms of quarantining individuals if that needs to be uh, and, and a lot of my experience has been doing tuberculosis uh, uh, outbreak uh, investigations, dengue fever in South Texas uh, evacuate displacement after Hurricane Katrina to the Corpus Christi area. So a lot of my interest, especially in this course, is with the police power of the state, especially with regard to outbreaks. Uh, we were discussing earlier the Ebola situation and how that could potentially impact uh, the way we do things here in the United States uh, and also the impact of certain outbreaks of this nature on constitutional freedoms, freedom of movement, and freedom of association. So I'm very interested in this, and I'm very happy to uh, have been invited to uh, uh, participate in this conversation. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Um, uh, Tony? Yeah, let me just turn on my camera. Hello, I'm Tony Yannick. Um, I'm going to be helping with a lot of the technical stuff, but I'm also going to participate in the in the, in the seminar. I'm going to do the readings and help with the, and uh, chime in because I do not have a very good political, uh, like academic political background. But it's a very uh, I have a, a lot of sympathies for it and a lot, a lot of interest in it. And Jason knows this, uh, and hopefully find out more. Um, yeah, I think that's a good enough introduction, I guess, for me. Thank you. Um, Tristan? Sure. Uh, so I don't have a PhD. <laughs> I've been in graduate school long enough to that should, but uh, that's all right. Um, I came to political theory. My current kind of bend in political theory is sort of, on the one hand, very interested in anti-colonial thought, and on the other hand, interested in kind of Eurocentric uh, thought between like phenomenological thought and rationalist thought and trying to make a uh, kind of bridge between those things. Uh, interested in Deleuze and Foucault. Uh, yeah, just generally lots of interest kind of having had a long, hard time kind of coming down to sit on any particular thing. I've been involved in this project for the last five years in Ireland. It used to be called the... Um, so, uh, theory and Philosophy Summer School, and recently it's called the Economy and Society Summer School. Very interdisciplinary project. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of my kind of political theory formation comes from that kind of blending of like socius, like doing sociology right alongside doing political theory. Mm -hmm. yeah, interdisciplinary cool. approach, yeah. where, where in Ireland is that? Uh, it's associated with University College Cork. But it's in a small oh. town. It's actually in a castle. And you guys should all you should all come this year. It's gonna be great. Oh, cool. Yeah, my my fam my my ancestors are from Cork. I'm not gonna say my family's from Cork, but some of my ancestors are from Cork. Also, I'm I'm in Toronto. I'm, I'm living in Toronto. Right. 
Right, right. You live in Toronto, right? Yeah, and I and I live um, in a communal hippie vegan house, so my roommates are wandering it sometimes. Okay, cool. And uh, and Tony's coming from. You're coming from Glasgow, right, Tony? Yeah, I'm in Glasgow, Scotland. Okay, starting my PhD at University of Glasgow. Yeah, yeah I, I I just asked that question because it kind of helps to like get some sense of where everybody's actually coming from. It's kind of interesting to to see that. Um, okay, so uh, so I'll just give like a, a kind of a general overview of the course, um, and then and then we'll go into the syllabus. Um, probably the easiest way would be to just go right to the syllabus and and do that. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, is share my screen. Um, a second here. Okay. Are, are you seeing the syllabus now? Uh, yeah, we were. Yes. You were. Okay. 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 So, um, so as you can see here, we have. Uh, um, so uh, our guests will be uh, Bruce De Medici, uh, Jasper Poir, um, Jerome Emmanuel Roos, and Mohammed Salemi. Uh, I already said a little bit about um, how Bruce will figure into the course, um, and uh, I think th the way that he'll figure in will be, you know, kind of a preview of, of what may or may not happen later, which would be a follow-up course, uh, uh, kind of on on actual cases, um, and uh, and then um, and then uh, Jasper Poir, uh, and that'll be, I believe, that'll happen next week. And uh, Jasper Poir will be with us the um, the last day of, the, of of that we meet, and um, she has a book called uh, Terrorist Assemblages, and uh, basically looks at what she calls um, homo nationalism, and uh, and sexual exception sexual exceptionalism, and kind of the way that um, you know declarations of of states of emergency and uh, uh, kind of just exceptionalistic. Um, kind of approaches to politics, how they figure into sexuality, how um, sexual minorities themselves uh, end up enacting the kind of exceptional exceptional politics of the dominant society in the first place, and uh, a lot of stuff like that. And it's, she has a really interesting reading of Abu Ghraib that we'll that we'll read later, um, and the photos that came out of that, and uh, the rhetoric and that sort of thing. Um, Jerome Emanuel Roos uh, is the um, one of the founding editors of Roar magazine. If people have seen that, um, and he wrote a really great piece on basically using Agamben Schmidt and Benjamin uh, to read to kind of look look at and read the um, the Ferguson uprising and kind of the government response to it. Why the government response was so was so harsh. Why the National Guard was ca called out for the first time in in quite a while. Um, and just addressing those questions through kind of emergency powers theory. And then uh, Mohammed Salemi will come in um, during our last meeting, which is also when Jasper will be there. Um, and in that meeting, we'll be looking at uh, basically all of the sort of most contemporary uh, readings in, in this genre of, of thought. So that will be one we'll look at, uh, at Nick Land's latest stuff on, neo on neocameralism. Which is basically decisionism. Uh, looking at um, Mencius Moldbug's latest work on that, um, and they are actually defending it, uh, which I certainly don't. But um, but it's important to be kind of up on what you know where these discourses are are actually happening. Um, and then uh, Jasper Poir will speak, speak on terrorist assemblages. We're also going to read uh, Reza Nigaristani on uh, kind of uh, war. And how how uh, wartime um, powers are enacted, and uh, and the effects of that, and then also um, Achille Mbembe's uh, necropolitics, which is a kind of um, post-colonial reading of Agamben and and uh, and and the sort of emergency powers type of type of political thought. So um, I'll just go into the description here. Um, in the first part here, basically what we're talking about is. Uh, so there's this quote from uh, uh, St. Louis Police Chief uh, Sam Dotson. Um, I didn't see many people post about this personally, but uh, 
you know, during during the Ferguson um, uprising after Michael Brown was shot, uh, there was another person named uh, Kajemi Powell who who was who was shot by St. Louis police um, in the city of St. Louis. And uh, and when 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 the police chief was asked to say, well, you know, why why was he shot? Uh, his response was, my officers have the right to go home at night. <clears throat> so. Um, I put this in here at the beginning because I think it really kind of um, shows how 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 permeated uh, liberal capitalist societies are by by the idea of decisionism and how uh, how kind of how kind of pervasive this this <clears throat> this this sort of um, idea is. And you know we'll we'll talk later about the readings and about Carl Schmitt, uh, but one of the things that he that he makes um, very clear to point out is that. You know, in in a liberal cap capitalist democracy, you still have, um, you know, as Foucault said, we still haven't yet cut off the head of the king. We still have uh, basically a monarch. Um, and uh, but with within a liberal, you know, within liberal societies, it's not quite the same. Of course, it you know, arguably, it goes all the way down to the local level. Um, the fact that there's always one kind of head, uh, you know, executive figure, such as the president or um, or we have uh, certain people who are who are invested with with executive powers, such as um, police officers and others who can kind of randomly make decisions, um, such as whether or not to pull the trigger and and kill somebody, uh, which is kind of the, the ultimate decision. And um, so, just this idea: my officers have the right to go home at night. What, what is he actually saying there? He's, uh, you know, I think what he's doing there. Um, if you remember the the Schmidt reading. Uh, for today, you know, the counter-reactionary argument, or sorry, the counter-revolutionary argument um, uh, in the philosophy of the state that we read in Donoso Cortez, that we read in De Maestra, and uh, all of these the, these types of figures, what they're really saying is that, you know, they don't want to live in a world governed by discussion. They don't want to live in a world governed by uh, what Schmidt describes as, as endless discussion. Um, rather, What's really important is the ability to make a decision. The fact that they are, um, the fact that there is somebody who has the right to decide, and uh, does not have to worry about their um, decision being, you know, checked or second guessed or questioned, but can just simply make a decision and um, and and do what they want to do. And one of the key things in there, and this is one of the things that has always really interested me. Is the question of time? How 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 does the how does the um, how does time figure into the way that decisions are made? And you know, basically, what is being said when it, when when the statement is is being you know articulated that you know we don't want to have a government by discussion. We want to we don't want to have this endless discussion. Well, the word endless there is saying we don't want to take all of this extra time in deciding collectively. What the right thing to do is, we want to just make this decision. So, I think also in that that this idea of decisionism is basically that this you know it's figured as a uh, a philosophy of uh, a political philosophy of of efficiency, a political philosophy of speed, of speedily and quickly um, deciding what to do. So, my officers have the right to go home at night, meaning um, you know they don't. Have to sit there and argue with somebody who's mentally ill outside of a uh, grocery store, which is what was happening in this case. Uh, I think he took a candy bar or something like that, uh, but he was clearly, you know, had had some kind of mental disturbance. And um, the argument was, you know, well, I don't want to argue with this guy. Uh, you know, who knows what he might do? Why not just kill him? Um, and that's basically the argument that's made. You know. It's it's all about speed and how how quickly something gets done with how quickly someone gets to go home at night and and all of that. Um, there's a lot of ways to read it, but that's that's the angle that I personally find interesting here. Um, so I put that at the beginning, um, and then uh, I go on and I say uh, historically, decisionist political thought has sought to preserve the prerogative of the sovereign to remain unencumbered by the letter of the law in situations deemed to be emergencies, however an emergency might be defined. And uh, and I go on and say that this has um, been in recent years in particular we've seen more and more of a rise of decisionism. Um, uh, you know I think for sure after obviously after 9/11 uh, 
that was really when Agamben kind of became more and more popular as a figure and as a thinker because he um, because he was he was engaged with this, this exact thematic in political thought um, and uh, and you know uh, if you remember George W. Bush he referred to himself as the decider and uh, that raised a lot of people's eyebrows but um, I think there's a reason for it which is that uh, you know there that this remains with us and you know part of part of the decisionist argument is that liberal is that liberalism is liberalism is actually somewhat decisionist uh, and so the idea being that they just don't go quite far enough uh, and that they should go further so um, yeah so so there's that case there's also the Michael Brown case uh, which I bring up here in the in the description um, uh, the mass protest the National Guard um, and then uh, it, in, in Michigan in particular, uh, we've seen the rise of emergency managers. They were originally called emergency financial managers, uh, and they were later, then they later changed that to just simply emergency managers. They actually changed the nomenclature for that. Um, and if you read Agamben on this topic, he, Agamben basically says that um, historically it's almost always the case that uh, the way that dictatorship emerges or that decisionist political structure, if we want to use a more neutral sounding language, um, the way that decisionist political structures emerge and become solidified usually begins with uh, a declaration of a financial emergency and then that becomes extended to something else um, and it becomes a, a generalized um, discourse of emergency and, and need for control. Uh, so I find that interesting that that shifted. But we've seen that here in Michigan in, I think it's like 20 different municipalities. Most of these municipalities, such as Detroit, Flint, Pontiac, other cities, um, most of these municipalities are majority people of color uh, and primarily African Americans in most cases. Um, and, uh, and certainly, usually uh, pretty impoverished cities as well. And you know, you're not really seeing calls for that in in more middle class or, or wider um, cities in the state. So there's also the question of how, how does race play into this? Uh, in Carl Schmidt, you know, there's the constant invocation of the enemy. Um, and he basically says that if you can't, if you cannot clearly state who the enemy is, then you're not really dealing with politics. And um, because the essence of the political is the ability to declare an enemy. And um, if you're if you if you can't declare an enemy, it's you're not that, that's not politics. Um, so the fact that liberalism no longer explicitly declares an enemy per se, but kind of implicitly implies it through these types of government structures, is something that we might want to think about in this class. Um, and uh, and of course this isn't just you know like a, a local thing either. Uh, I made sure to put in the globalized market economy, um, geopolitics, because uh, this is th this is a situation that's really um, quite global. So, um, you know, and so you can see this in, you know, as I say after that, uh, you can see this in, you know, post-industrial kind of Rust Belt cities uh, where the, the economic infrastructure is kind of collapsed. Um, you see more and more of that. that. That's not particularly surprising, but you also see it in uh, in in um, kind of uh, imperial post imperial uh, regions of the world that are um, subjected to to uh, war to um, obviously austerity measures through the IMF and the World Bank and that kind of thing uh, this type of rhetoric is often invoked and um, is often there and I end that first paragraph with uh, a quote from Kevin Orr who is the emergency manager of Detroit. Um, and uh, he said, and he basically said uh, when he was when he was questioned, you know, how do you feel about being in this position where you can just kind of make decisions? You don't have to refer to the city council. You don't have to worry about anyone rebuking you. Um, he actually used the word free. He said, "I'm I'm free. I'm not a politician." And I found that especially interesting because when I was uh, studying with Agamben, I went and looked up. Um, I went through actually went through Mein Kampf because. I was thinking of his critiques of liberalism and how liberalism actually has this kind of authoritarian um, 
side to it that is not often not often acknowledged. And I uh, searched through. I did a word search on in Mein Kampf for the word uh, freedom, liberty, free, and things like that. And it's just totally chock full of of references to freedom. Um, but of course, freedom in this case is you know the freedom of the freedom of a very specific group. So in the seminar, uh, we're basically what we're going to do is, um, and this is what the second paragraph deals with. Uh, we're going to uh, trace and reshape the past and future of decisionism in political thought and state practice alike, um, providing an introduction to the thematic appropriate to the early 21st century. And then I have a quote here from Deleuze and Guattari where they say, um, "Quote the totality." The totalitarian state is not a maximum state, but rather the minimum state of anarcho-capitalism. And uh, I think you can see that really clearly in in the rise of emergency managers, the way that um, I mean, the same people pushing for emergency managers are the exact same people who are pushing for neoliberal policy um, today. And uh, you can also look back at like you know Pinochet. Uh, and his relation to um, the Chicago Boys and and other figures like that, um, and then we'll so through this class we're going to be we'll, we'll consider uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries precursors to decisionism, uh, looking at um, monarchist reactions uh, against the English, um, French, and American revolutions, uh, looking a bit at Hobbes, uh, Donoso Cortez, and Fr Francis de Maistre. Um, Today we're not really going to like look at the, at those at those three in particular. We're going to look more at uh, what Carl Schmitt, how Carl Schmidt um, used their ideas. But I did I did put the readings in the classroom for people to look at. Um, and we'll also engage the 20th century decisionism of Carl Schmitt, uh, people like Julius Evola, um, and some other people who who made these arguments. Uh, and then we'll be juxtaposing them constantly, be constantly between. Um, my hope in this class is to have kind of a constant juxtaposition between sort of uh, right-wing authoritarian uh, arguments for decision, uh, for decisionism, and then juxtaposing them to more left um, radical critiques of that. Um, but uh, yeah, so people like Walter Benjamin and Giorgio Gombin. Um, and, uh, and then finally, we'll close the class, um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, looking at um, Achille Mbembe, Jasper Poir, Reza Nagarastani, and much more recent figures like that, and uh, trying to think about what the significance of this is today. Um, if, if, if people have been following this history, you, you probably know already that Agamben has kind of um, declined as a, uh, as, as a um, especially um, influential figure. Over time, but um, but at the same time, you know, these these arguments um, do continue, and so hopefully we'll be able to look at that. Um, all right. So, any questions or, or or responses to to this to these themes so far? Just that that they're uh, I certainly think they're timely and and I I think a lot of these themes are maybe subtle and not so obviously present in in our governmental policies many of them at a very local municipal level and and I I, I like the assemblage of people that we have especially the idea of I, I'm very interested to know um, what sort of uh, commentary comes from the sense of someone who has a, a role in county politics. Mm -hmm. County health politics to see how some of these issues are implicated because I'm I'm sure they're there but it may be somewhat subtle. It's good to articulate them. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you have any response to that, Harry? Well, in terms of the um, county politics, uh, as you know, Nevada is a very uh, sort of independent-minded state, so the um, the influence of, of county government upon individuals uh, is very can, can and has been very contentious in the past. Now, in terms of, of managing um, from a public health and, and public safety perspective, uh, there have been cases where I have had to intervene in order to stop, for example, uh, 
destructive rumors or concerns, things that were uh, of a nature that that uh, were not justified by the evidence. So, you know, and that's that's mostly where I've been involved. But my uh, my current interest, especially with the Ebola. Uh, concern is we do get people that are coming to and from Africa going to my, we will should we uh, face a, a, an issue of, of an exposure so th th this is something that's very interesting for me hmm. okay um, how, about, how about you Aaron what do you, what do you think so far no I, I mean it, it seems like a, a pretty solid run through of that tradition and its relevance couldn't couldn't be more of a parent <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. hmm. I don't know I, I'm just wondering about about how we can sort of focus this or sort of wondering about where where to sort of focus my efforts yeah uh, what, what are you? What, what are you? Um, what are you planning to do ne next? Like, are you are you in grad school right now, or are you planning to? Are you are you you're applying right now? I'm not. I'm sort of putting off applying for another six months to a year, probably next sort of next. Okay. Season, at least. So. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I mean, one way to approach it would be to just think about, you know, um, what would you like to do next? Like, if you, you know, if you're if you're thinking about, I mean, you may not know. Get what you want to do next, but if you have some projects that you've worked on in the past, and maybe mm -hmm. there's some way that those past projects would relate to this and kind of bring you in a direction that would set you up for whatever you want to do later. I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. I, um, I mean, I, I certainly sort of want to use this to to revisit sort of some of my past work mm -hmm. uh, and update it. Uh, and certainly. Uh, been been following sort of both the neo reactionary and and neo rationalists. Oh, you have been. Sort of. okay. Yeah. So what, what, I mean, what do you what do you think of the neo reactionaries? Oh, I mean it's fascinating stuff. It's <laughs> kind of terrifying, but there's also this sort of uh, yeah sense of like fascination and pull that when you're reading that stuff. I mean, Land is almost trolling everyone in a way. He kind of writes the perfect things to to respond against, particularly his thing about public order and the sort of natural freedom. The, I don't know, it's sort of amazing to read his text from 10 years ago and now. Uh, yeah. What, could, you, could, you, could you give just like a, just like a really brief um, description of, of what, what, act, what, what Neo Reaction is? Sure. It's, um, it's kind of a loose collection of of different ideologies, some of them very Catholic uh, and statist and sort of the Demeistra tradition, some of it mm -hmm. sort of this far-right libertarian fringe, and it's not so much a community as sort of an online sort of affinity group for people right. who reject everything about political correctness and this sort of very, yeah, reactionary. I, I, Nietzsche and Rosante Malk kind of sums up their, their worldview and outlook. Um, mm -hmm. Opinions and uh, and beliefs that most people wouldn't sort of accept in pub in like in public conversation. Uh, Would, wouldn't it wouldn't it seem like libertarians and monarchists would not would have like zero in common? Yes and no. I mean, they, basically, their version of monarchism is basically court like blanket like corporate authority, and you see that. I think in Hobbes, in my reading, in reading Hobbes, that becomes very clear that it's sort of monarchy is kind of just a brand, and they right. they own the corporation for the good of the shareholders, and so you can depend on them more than bickering parties that that would right. sort of I don't know. It's like a body where where the lungs can tell you not to smoke because <laughs> because right. it's bad for them, or or your liver can tell you not to drink. Um, right. And so, so so in this model, um, in this model, this the CEO is basically the monarch in a way, and and they're 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 so far as I understand it, we'll, we'll read this stuff later. Uh, it's very possible you may have read this stuff more in depth than I have because um, it's fairly new, so I don't 
<clears throat> I, don't, I don't know it super well, but my understanding is that they're kind of saying that um, in their ideal state, uh, the the CEO would be uh, would be sort of like a like a monarch. Yes, like that a, that you could depend on, like say, incorporating cities much better, and why one of their things is sort of this like seasteading or uh, being able to sort of buy and trade citizenship. If you don't like the laws of a community, you're not the one to set it, but you can always opt out and move to another community where you do sort of buy into their their sort of brand or their founding right. epic as it right. is. Uh, and so they think by sort of creating free trade in communities and in sort of institutional belonging, you can eliminate these sorts of uh, mismanagement that goes on with democratic mm -hmm. or liberal mm -hmm. governance. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's a very corporate model for society. And I guess my interest is sort of looking at the institutional dynamics that Sort of rationalism could propose to counter mm -hmm. that yeah. in some sort of way, uh, because while I don't see these ideas catching on in any kind of public way, there are influential people who buy into them, people with quite a lot of money and connections yeah. in Silicon Valley who buy into them, and I mean, sort of like Schmidt, who was never popular, but whose ideas totally describe what's going on. It's the sort of thing that sort of independent of the crazy theorists who who blog about it on the internet, people, I mean, it is more functional and practical, the things they're talking about, than, than mm -hmm. the society we live in that is clearly broken. So you read these things and you go, they're on to something, but it's also, it's got to be something other than this, what I'm looking for. Uh, and, and, and the other side of it, too, is, I mean, I guess my interest in it is, is you know, just thinking about... Um, the fact, I mean, where is neoliberalism heading? The, the further and further we privatize everything, um, regardless of what, whether we would want to live in, in a neo cameralist society like they're describing, um, where are we actually heading? You know, it, it may be something a lot like that, regardless of whether, you know, regardless of whether there's, regardless of whether um, that's what they want or not. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, it, it, any other reactions from Tristan, or, or I should say, responses, not reactions? <laughs> Sorry, I think, I think my microphone's unmuted now. Um, okay, so my first question would be something like, I know I'm, I might, I might uh, have misread this, but from looking at the, the readings and from your introductory, uh, your excellent introductory discussion, um, I get the sense that we're talking about decisionism mostly in terms of uh, kind of reactionary. Uh, political movements, reactionary political phases, but isn't there also like a progressive side to decisions? Mm -hmm. Isn't there like something like a ref left republican tradition? Um, mm -hmm. Isn't the role of sovereignty in in revolt? And also, I mean, even like having been involved in like Occupy Toronto stuff a couple of years ago, like isn't even like the most like progressive, inclusive, anti-oppressive form of like consensus building also basically in the end a way of deciding who's going to be excluded, like who mm -hmm. who will be outside the? I mean, it's not we're not going to. Not right. by the law or anything, but in in in, in the localist sense, a little bit, right? So that's mm -hmm. one question. Are we going to look at the progressive side of decisionism? And, and the, the other other question, just just in generally in response to the stuff about uh, emergency planners and uh, like uh, uh, cities in in Michigan losing their sovereignty and the kind of the alliance between. Uh, kind of increase, like decreasing political accountability, like increasing like totalitarianism um, and neoliberal reforms. Like I, I, I feel like um, I heard this really. I should plug Adam Hania's book, a really excellent book on the history of uh, uh, the, the kind of neoliberal economic policies across the Middle East, uh, kind of well back fifties, but mostly kind of from nineteen eighty to present. Feels mm -hmm. like, feels like. The, the very similar processes happen. Like the the, the idea that um, uh, political, like like a reduction in political accountability, like goes along with an increase in political austerity. Uh, mm -hmm. maybe, that, maybe that might be an interesting connection to to make it something. But uh, generally, yeah. Very, of course. Yeah, I mean, you, you bring up Occupy, and um, that reminds me. I mean, one thing I write about my book. I, I actually write about this exact topic of this class in in my book, in my in the um, third chapter. Uh, 
And one of the things I talk about in there is the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat in, in Marx, you know. And, I mean, he is using this term dictatorship, and there's kind of a question. I've heard some people defend it by saying, well, he's not, he's not saying, he wasn't referring to, like, you know, Stalin or Lenin or something like that. He was referring to, when he said dictatorship, he meant more like um, somebody, you know, dictating but not, not, not in the sense of like authoritatively commanding something, but rather um, dictating um, the collective will uh, about some issue. And uh, if, you know, I remember one of the things that he said about that was that uh, the proletariat is, you know, well over 90% of humanity. So um, if, if that's a dictatorship, then it's also kind of a democracy. <laughs> it's, it's a, you know, it, it could be actually... Um, dictatorship of the proletariat in the purest sense is actually something a lot like Occupy. Um, and yet it still uses this word dictatorship. So, so there's something interesting in there. I'm not quite sure what, what, what exactly um, it is, but uh, I know that in um, the reason I put it in the reading list, uh, The Civil Wars in France by Marx, is that in that, in that text he talks about the Paris Commune, um, and the way that the Paris Commune was governed through, like, totally direct dem democracy. And he raises this, this issue where he says, um, um, he says, you know, people have criticized us for this concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat, but actually the way that the Paris Commune was run, which was direct, you know, basically direct democracy, more or less, um, is that is what we meant by the dictatorship of the proletariat. We just mean that, that the proletariat will collectively decide and will no longer be decided upon. So, um, so there, you know, there is some, there, there is some question there. I guess there's also the question too of like in, in periods of like social transformation or like a revolutionary situation, how, how would the left, how would the left decide about how a revolution is going to go? Um, you know, and, and would there be, would there be, uh, would it remain a totally horizontal type of structure or would there be um, some type of deciding figure who would, who would decide how certain things went, you know, like in a revolutionary moment? But, yeah, just something to think about. All right. Um, so... So I'm going to go back to the screen share, and we'll go through um, just the various weeks a little bit. And uh, just to refresh our memories, what we said. Um, uh, so we'll finish going over the syllabus, and then the next thing we're going to do is um, assign readings. And, uh, and uh, we'll get to that, and then we'll come to the actual reading for today in, in a bit. Okay, so... Um, so down here, these are these are the readings for the class, um, like the official readings that that everybody's supposed to read. Um, not all of them are required, so don't look at this list and and be too overwhelmed. Um, let me just go through the schedule first, and then we'll go through the requirements because uh, it's a little more detailed. Um, so the first week, um, you'll see the only thing that is required for this week is Carl Schmitz on the counter revolutionary philosophy of the state. And, uh, and I also put it in, um, and these are in the classroom, I put uh, Hobbes of Commonwealth, which is where he really talks about um, what the role of the, um, of the head of state is uh, and what powers they have ascribed to them. Um, Denoso Cortez, Solutions of the Liberal School. This is a, a, a brief excerpt from his um, book, uh, essays, on so, uh, essays on Catholicism, Socialism, and Capitalism, I believe it was, is what it's called. And then uh, De Maestra's Infallibility, which is from his um, pretty long book called On the Pope uh, that, that deals with the infallibility, infallibility of, of the Pope in, in Catholic political thought. Um, not all Catholic political thought, but his version of it. Uh, and then on um, Wednesday, we're going we're gonna to discuss uh, Agamben's State of Exception. Uh, I have an excerpt from that. Um, Walter Benjamin's Critique of Violence, and then uh, two very short pieces from Julius Avola, um, uh, one of which is specifically on Donoso Cortez, and the other one, To Be of the Right. Uh, and both of these are very much centrally focused on the question of decisionism and what Evola has said about that um, historically. 
Um, and then, uh, and then uh, I put a suggested uh, Gopal Bali Krishnan history and politics and in, in interview. Um, we're still seeing whether he might come and say hello to the class briefly. Um, I don't know if people know about his work, but it's <clears throat> he's he's on the board of uh, the New Left Review. Um, he has a whole book that's just on Carl Schmidt called The Enemy. That's really good. Um, and uh, and then our guest will be um, Bruce. And uh, and then on uh, next Sunday we'll read uh, Samuel Huntington, The Crisis of Democracy. Um, we're actually reading three three texts that are basically all have the same title, Crisis of Democracy. So Samuel Huntington's The Crisis of Democracy, which is from the 60s, and is basically a call for um, a response to the new social movements of the 60s, and basically saying that there was too much democracy happening then in, in those movements, um, and that there was a need to restrain them. Uh, Carl Schmitt's Crisis of Par Parliamentary Democracy, um, and then uh, and then two more recent texts from Elaine Benoist, who's a, um, a, a right-wing figure in France, uh, one of which is Crisis of Democracy, again, and then Carl Schmitt in France. And then the final one will be um, Bonnie Honig, uh, her book, Emergency Politics, Paradox, Law, and Emergency. That one is just suggested. You don't have to read that. Um, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then our guest that day will be a Jer Jerome Manuel Roos. And then the final week, the final day, um, the Wednesday after this coming Wednesday, we'll read Mbembe, Nigarastani, um, Jasper Poir, and then we'll also be reading uh, the parts of The Dark Enlightenment by Nick Land that deal with neocameralism and uh, Mencius Moldbug's um, Against Political Freedom. So, all right, so um, so just to go over the requirements of the seminar. Um, Hold on. Yeah, please. Go just ahead. A, a question about the Bonnie Honig book. How yeah. much... How much of that, or are there sections in that we should focus on? I guess you can, the closer yeah. we get to it. But, uh, but, I mean, the whole thing's on ARG, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 actually, um, I actually put up just, uh, just excerpts because um, legally, uh, under fair use laws, as I understand them anyway, um, uh, it's, you know, a, a professor or a teacher can, can um, you know, share, share certain portions of a, of a, of a reading, but can't really do a whole book. So, um, so given that, I I just took out uh, I I think it's the first the first two chapters and then like the very last part of the book. Um, but they're 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 all in the um, they're all in the classroom if you want to okay. see them. There. So, um, yeah, but yeah, she's she's really excellent. Um, she she really wanted to actually come on this class and and be a uh, and be a guest. Um, but unfortunately, was not able to. Um, there's still a slight possibility, but I, I don't think it's going to work. But mm -hmm. it may may happen. We'll see. Um, okay, so in terms of uh, the way that we're going to kind of organize the class, um, basically every day, every class lasts uh, two and a half hours. Uh, we're already at six thirty right now. We did start a little bit late though. Um, but basically, mm -hmm. going from um, five thirty to or sorry, from 5 to uh, 7.30, and we'll take a break kind of halfway in between, a pretty short break. Um, and we'll have a, a, you know, a brief introduction to the session. Uh, we usually have a guest appearance, um, and then right after the guest speaks, then we'll have a, a student-facilitated group discussion. Um, and then what we do after that is, uh, this is something I picked up from teaching at Williams College in Massachusetts. Um, they do, and I believe they got it from Oxford, uh, which is uh, tutorial presentations where the students present on the readings and um, kind of in relation to whatever they're working on, students present on the readings and then, um, the, then the students, then that student is kind of cross-examined by the professor um, and, you know, I won't do it in like an authoritarian way, but just, <laughs> but it's just sort of like, uh, you know, responded to in relation to the readings and and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so that that makes it so that it's not just the professor, you know, giving their opinion of it, but the students are also like kind of actively, actively producing their own readings and and, and discussion and that kind of thing. Um, as far as like the focus of what uh, of what to um, 
of, of what kind of presentation to give and that sort of thing, uh, both for myself and for everybody in the class. Um, this will come from applying the concept of decisionism, um, the way that it's presented in the course readings, to primary sources of information and data, uh, engaging material problems and fields of knowledge throughout this process. So ideally what, what would happen is, you know, let's say you might take, um, say in Aaron's case, you know, uh, Aaron's been reading uh, Menzies Smoldbug and, and Nick Land on neocameralism and near reaction. So um, ideally what I'd really like to see is, is uh, uh, um, I say here right after that, students will engage both left and right arguments. Uh, writing four mini essays of 500 to 1,000 words each, um, and uh, two of them being due at the end of each week. Um, so, really, would you know? Ideally, would be something like you know, maybe you would juxtapose Mencius Moldbug to uh, a left thinker like, say, I don't know, Giorgio Agamben, because um, they're both dealing with basically the same. You know, they're dealing with the same text, the exact same theme, the exact same question, but they come at it from totally different angles. So. How would you um, how would you um, understand the relationship between two seemingly very different thinkers, and then try to try to find some material site or object to look at? So uh, maybe you might want to look at um, you know some kind of dark science fiction you know dystopian science fiction film about uh, kind of encroaching um, authoritarian governance structures, whether corporate or or state you know, like, I don't know, like Minority Report or something like that, um, and then relate it to that so that so that you're not just, like, kind of stuck purely in the text, but you're, like, actively trying to apply it to some actual thing. Um, other people who are maybe a little more activist-minded might want to think about how does this relate to, say, um, uh, the uprising in Ferguson, how does, re how does this relate to, um, I don't know, emergency managers in Michigan or, or however you would want to do that. Um, but the idea there being kind of, and honestly for me this, this does kind of come out of theory and event, uh, my experience there, because I, re I really um, found what they did compelling, which is that, you know, they weren't just doing kind of theory or, or critical or political theory abstractly, but were actually trying to like think about how does this actually apply in a given situation? How does this actually play out in the end? Um, and how can how can theory help us see events in different ways? So, um, okay, so uh, yeah, so so those are the basic assignments, um, and uh, these mini essays will be posted in the Google Classroom, and uh, everyone will read and comment upon them, um, and that'll provide some um, threads for discussions, I hope. Um, and then once that's once the end of the class has happened. Um, uh, af after you post it, um, uh, I will get back to you within you know 24 to 48 hours and give you a pretty thorough response to whatever you wrote um, and try to offer suggestions for revision. Um, and then uh, and then towards the end, hopefully, um, if you have if you have a pretty solid piece between these different things, um, you know if they're on similar themes, then I could try to uh, what I would try to do is to help you. Um, promote it to see if it could get published in uh, an academic uh, journal or or maybe a more para-academic kind of environment, you know, um, maybe like a, a theory blog or somewhere that you would like to be, um, to, to see your work show up in. So I would try to help you do that. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's move on now to just um, talking about the readings and who would like to present on what. Um, so we can start with uh, let's start with uh, we'll just start with next week because we're not going to do that this week, obviously. Um, and what we did in the last class, we can do we can do again, um, which is that we basically divided up the readings and um, and some people really wanted to do readings that were from the first week. And so if you would like to do that that's totally fine. And so I'm just going to mark this down and uh, you can say which, which reading you'd like to do. Um, but I'll start, with, uh, I'll start with next week. So next week for the required readings we have Agamben's State of Exception, uh, Benjamin's Critique of Violence, and uh, the two readings from Julia Savola on uh, Donoso Cortez and To Be of the Right.
Who would like to who would like to present on Agamben, for example? Jason, I just want to clarify. Yeah. You said next week, but you mean Wednesday of this I'm coming. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. It's okay. It's all right. I'm a simple guy. I get confused easily. That's all. <laughs> yeah. For, oh. uh, and I think you're reading off the wrong list of reading. What's that? Oh, this Wednesday it's Schmidt, Benjamin, or maybe the, the PDF has a different... Oh, no, no, I, I actually changed... Um, you changed it. Okay, I'm yeah, looking yeah. up a different list then. Yeah, you're, you're looking at an earlier version. I'm sorry about that. I should, have, no I, I, should, I should have said that at the beginning. The most updated version of the syllabus is, um, is in the classroom. Um, and if you have any problems... Has everybody been able to get into the classroom? I don't think everybody's in, so... Okay, uh, okay, yeah. yeah. I think... I'm not in. Okay. Actually, what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to screen share again just to make sure that everybody is seeing the same thing that I'm seeing when I'm talking about what I'm seeing. The, if you do have questions on getting into the, in, into the classroom or you have any problems, you can feel free to contact me as well. Or you just the registrar or, or any of those emails. Okay. Okay. Bruce, I can contact you personally and, and because it's a different line. Yes, that's fine. That's fine. We don't. Have to, we'll talk about it later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, can everybody see my screen? I can. <laughs> okay. So this is the. I'm just gonna. First thing I'm gonna do is just copy this and put this on the sidebar in the actual hangout, and that way everybody is looking at the same list of readings. Um. So, okay. Copy, paste. There we go. Great. Okay. So on the right-hand side there, you should see the list of readings. Um, and I'll also have it on my screen. Uh, and this is the most updated version. Um, if, if for any reason people can't get into the classroom, um, then we'll try and figure that out. But meanwhile, I can send you this most updated version. Um, okay. So... Uh, so for, for next week, we have a Gomben. It looked like uh, Tristan said he wanted to present on that. Is that right, Tristan? I mean, if, if, if somebody else wants to, that, that's fine, too. But I'd, I'd be yeah. quite happy to put on a Gomben because I've been writing about a Gomben lately in relation to uh, uh, various political things. So Great. Yeah. I'd be happy to do that. Um, how about Walter Benjamin? Uh, sure. I'll do the Benjamin meeting. Okay. And the very strange fascist Julius Ebola, who would like to do that? <laughs> no, he is very strange. If you look into him, he's a, a very, very strange person. Do people? Do people? I guess. I guess you know. I guess it would help if people understood why they might be interesting. Um, Julius Julius Evola. Uh, if you don't know about his work, um, I mostly put him in here just because he he is one of the people in this line of thinking who who is explicitly a, dis a decisionist. Um, but he he's in the background of uh, what's called um, esoteric Hitlerism, which is basically this idea that. Um, it's basically an idea that that Hitler was uh, a, de a deity, and uh, and Julius Ebola was very like interested in relationship between um, kind of German uh, fascist or German Nazi um, uh, kind of mythological background and how they related to uh, South Asia, how it related to um, um, to uh, Hinduism and various things like that, and. Uh, so that's kind of the background of, of him, but, um, but yeah, he's a, he, he is very kind of strange. Um, anyone want to present on that? <laughs> I'm just feeling intimidated by by just how sort of uh, bizarre the bit, the material was. So that's why I even <laughs> okay. All right, so <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to volunteer for that one. Um, this material doesn't go into any of that esoteric Hitlerism, strange ideas. Uh, but yeah, I'll, so I'll do that one, and then you guys can do the other two. 
And then okay for for the uh, for the for the twelfth next Sunday. Uh, I yeah. I'd like to do the Carl Schmidt crisis to, unless someone else feels strongly about it. Okay. Um, Samuel Huntington. This this one is interesting. I think this Huntington one would be interesting to anybody who's interested in um, social movements, in kind of activist politics, uh, and that kind of thing, because that is what he's directly addressing, and he uses this sort of decisionist kind of rhetoric to um, to uh, make arguments for why why government suppression of um, of social movements in the '60s would have, would be a good idea. That one might be, I, I'm just guessing, but that one might be of interest to, to you, Tristan. Maybe. Do you, do you want that one, Tristan, or no? Oh, you already volunteered for one. Well, I mean, you can, it looks like, we, you know, we don't have a huge number of people in this class, so um, if you want to do more than one, you can. Are, are, sorry, are you talking about the Huntington reading? Yeah. Uh, so that's on, that's on next next Sunday. Sure, I can yeah. I can present that on that. Yeah. Okay. Great. And then that leaves uh, Elaine uh, Benoist. So if you if you want to understand how um, <clears throat> Benoist would would be one of the uh, figures who who is trying to resurrect these ideas. Uh, and actually enact them, um, and not in the way that, <clears throat> not in the kind of corporate way, but in like a pretty explicitly um, fascist way. Uh, so I don't know if anybody would like to present on that one. Uh, it, you you picked my interest, so <laughs> I'll present on that as well. Okay. I, there's there's a little bit of a private joke that I'll share with a group that uh, Jason knows I, I, I like sometimes to take a topic that might uh, be considered a little bit controversial or provocative just to, and so don't take that as an endorsement of the, of the writer's ideas I, I just like to have spirited conversation sure sure um, how, how about how about you Harry do you do it are any of these leaping out at you that you would like to do <laughs> I was looking at uh, the uh, Hunting piece, actually. The Huntington one? Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> oh, I you think know, he said the Hunting piece. Yeah. Oh, oh, the Bonnie Hunting. Okay. Hunnick. Yeah. On democracy, emergency politics. Yeah, let's do that. I think that would be really relevant for for uh, for your interest, actually. Yeah, that was actually looking pretty interesting to me. Okay. Yeah, because she does. She does kind of. Um, she, you know, she does kind of raise the question of, you know, uh, I mean, sometimes emergency is not a false claim. You know, sometimes there there are actual emergency issues, and and there are ways that they could be um, engaged. You know, even from the left and from more progressive perspectives. So, right. Uh, which would be great for somebody who's in healthcare, I would think. Um, okay, so uh, so the final week is uh, Akili Mbembe. I know that Mohammed wants to do Nagaristani here. So we'll save that one for him. Um, uh, and then that leaves uh, Akili Mbembe. Um, Anyone who's interested in the Gamban, I mean, Mbembe, Gamban or Foucault, Mbembe really takes uh, a Gamban to the next level, in my opinion. Like, it's it's really... I've, I've read that text before, so I would be happy to yeah. do that one as well. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Great. Okay, and then uh, Jasper Poir, um, Terrorist Assemblages. Well, actually, she'll be the guest in that one, so I guess she'll be presenting for herself, in a way. <laughs> so we could just do that. Jasper. 
And then that also leaves uh, Nick Land and Mencius Moldbug. Um, those are just suggested, but uh, if anybody would like to take that up, you can. You can put me down for land. I can make it to that. Okay. Um, and then just in case there's anybody who really wanted to dig into the readings for today and present on them, um, there's Schmidt. We're going to do that as a group, so probably not that one, but uh, if anybody really wants to get into Hobbes, Denoso Cortez, or De Maestra in more detail, um, you can speak up now or you can tell me next week if you want. I'll take a look at the Hobbes, and, and I'll, I'll let you know. I just don't want to be overly ambitious. Okay. I'll put Bruce maybe. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, all right, so let's see. Okay, so we signed the reading. So, um, all right, so we can just take a little. Uh, see, we got in here at about 5:20, um, 5:15. Um, let's just take just a, a short break before we come back to um, uh, because the next thing on the agenda is basically to uh, do an intro to the, to this actual class session that we're in right now, and then uh, do a reading of Schmidt's kind of re revolutionary philosophy of the state, um, and then have a discussion about it. So let's just take like a short, maybe like five, five or ten minute break and come back. Great. Sound good? Okay. Sounds good. So it's uh, six forty now. When do when do you want to come back? Six fifty. Yeah, let's say six fifty. Okay. Cool. See you soon. All right. Soon. Thanks.
Mm-hmm. <coughs> a lot of people that have a fucking wet dream. No. for like just unbridled corporate power. Yeah. I mean, I mean, are, are there, are there, I mean, not, not, not that this, not, not that this delegitimizes anything, but, but uh, I mean, are, are, are there also documented war crimes that were car- carried out by FSA uh, affiliated brigades? No. Because that's, that's just what they'll say, right? That, that's, people will say that, right? Yeah? Yeah? No, I know, I know, I know, but, but I know, that, but, that, but that's my question. Did the FSA commit crimes against villages? Yeah, 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 sure, 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 of course. Yeah.
Hello, Jason. Hey, are you back? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to wait for Bruce to come back because uh, one of the already wanted to say about um, Schmidt. <laughs> okay. Um, during the break, uh, I muted him, so he'll have to unmute himself. Oh. I'm here. Hey, Bruce. Okay. Okay, so, um, all right, so this, this, this book, um, I don't know if you would feel comfortable doing this, Bruce. I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, you, you've read Political Theology, right? I, I, I have. I, I, I'm happy to, to share some thoughts. I, I don't have a full-fledged presentation, but I like talking sure. about Schmidt, so I'm happy to start out. Yeah, I, I just thought maybe you could just say, um, like, what, what even is political theology in the first place as opposed to, say, political theory or something like that? Um, and and what, uh, what, what made you want to read this one in particular as opposed to other books by, by Schmidt? I, I, I'm going to answer your question, but perhaps a little different take that you had in mind, but this is a philosophy class. That's okay, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, see, I, I see Schmidt as something of a frustrated uh, humanist, and this sounds mm -hmm. counterintuitive, but I'll, I'll take a couple minutes and explain why I feel that way. Hmm. I, I think that uh, Schmidt had a reverence for what he saw as political theory, and my interpretation which is easy for me to say, um, is that he had in mind that there would be a, a serious sort of concerted dialogue among, uh, among citizens and politicians of how uh, politics could serve you know, the human condition. And I think that he was disappointed on two, uh, three salient fronts. I think he felt very threatened by um, anarchy and disorder in Germany. And I, I, I don't have an opinion as to whether that was uniquely or particularly pointed at, at the communists or at Marx in particular, but I think he felt, felt very threatened to a sense of order that he felt was in the best interest of the German Republic. And that comes out in many of his writings that he was, uh, that it sounds like he was authoritarian, and I, I just like to articulate the thesis that not so much that he was authoritarian, but he was threatened by disorder. And I also think that that he had the sense that uh, legislators um, either fell short of conducting their obligations to writing legislation that would allow people to present an order to their political affairs so that they could live their lives or that he genuinely felt that it just really wasn't realistically possible to effectively write legislation. There was always going to be shortcomings, loopholes, whatever term you want to use, and that he thought it was very important to identify uh, that um, ultimately there had to be an entity, a body, that possessed the authority to interpret these shortcomings, legislative shortcomings, and possess the authority to step in, interpret, be decisive, and maintain the order of the state, all to enable people to continue to engage in a dialogue uh, on the human condition. Now, he, you know, if you read the, when you read the chapter that you described, he's also very critical of my words, of economic interests, um, where or market interests, mercantile interests that would detract from the search for the truth of the human condition that he saw as the role of how he defined politics. He's critical of mercantile interests that, that detracted from that, that polluted that conversation. So that's, that's part of why I find it interesting to talk about Schmidt because this does what I express feels counterintuitive to this sort of tone. Um, it's very off-putting when you first start reading Carl Schmidt but I, I think that you can identify these themes that are articulated, and it isn't entirely clear, but I think that it does make for a, a sort of refreshing view on reading Schmidt 
I think it also helped keep him uh, contemporary because speaking from my experience, and this is you know the benefit to the group of people with different backgrounds, I spend all day long with people who are absorbed by mercantile interests. I spend all my day with capitalists, people who just have no sorts of uh, really serious considerations for what we would consider the human condition. And, and, and to me, Schmidt is uh, critical of them uh, in the same way, and, and it does lend a contemporary air to Schmidt's considerations that uh, people that I spend my day with uh, seem to have a sense of, um, if you will, abrogating any personal responsibility for considering um, de determinations or considerations of the human condition, considerations of political matters as Schmidt defines them, but instead have a sense that this is someone else's obligation and their obligation is limited to uh, pursuing the mercantile interest. They are abrogating, if you will, in Schmittian terms, their obligation to contribute to a dialogue on the improvement of the human condition. So that's that's my that's my thesis statement. <laughs> Great, thank you. Very good. Uh, yeah, and, and I guess the other part too, when you when you say political theology, there's kind of an implicit assumption there that um, <clears throat> that we can't get we can't we can't really just kind of um, uh, abdicate theology only to like its own precise realm because because you know there is a theological background to basically all contemporary um, political discourse and contemporary political um, situations, right? So, yeah. um, and, and so, so this is, would be one of the reasons why he's constantly bringing in, um, you know, even in a time that's much removed from Donoso Cortez or De Maestra uh, or other figures like that, uh, bringing in um, specifically Catholic political thought um, and, uh, and specifically certain types of Catholic political thought. Obviously there's there's you know liberation theology and all kinds of other more uh, left and progressive versions of, of Catholic political thought, um, but he definitely was not concerned with those. So uh, so so in, in so in his arguments, you know, he wants to say like you know okay yes we've secularized yes we've become uh, secular societies, but we still have many of the same vestiges of non secular societies um, in the past. They're still sort of there. And um, and given this like continuing presence of of uh, of, of pre secular um, governance structures, um, <clears throat> how do we how how do we think about these 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 um, their their persistence? And I think from what Bruce was saying, um, in in the economic sector, uh, yeah, there's definitely. I mean, when you when you read Schmidt, it it, it sounds quite a bit like a lot of uh, left-wing thought, uh, particularly anarchist thought, except um, uh, totally inverted um, as, as, as status thought. <laughs> but the critique of capitalism, of mercantile interests and that sort of thing is very, cl uh, is very clear too. Um, and that would make sense because obviously under monarchy, uh, <clears throat> the bourgeoisie as defined by Marx was not actually the ascendant class. The ascendant class at that time was the nobility. Um, so they're not really quite the same thing. Uh, and uh, in a in a liberal capitalist society, the um, the bourgeoisie is what is what you know um, wins over. Uh, so so it makes sense for uh, for a neo reactionary and for a um, and for a, uh, a decisionist kind of thinker like Schmidt to to really. Um, to almost sound a bit like an anti-capitalist, but to, <clears throat> but really, what is the nature of this of, of this version of decisionism? Um, I think you can really see that it's very very different from somebody like Nick Land or Mencius Moldbug, who are who are making a case for for decisionist political structures, but they're making that case uh, that that it would be wholly within capitalism, and the CEO would be basically um, a dictator. So there's a huge, huge difference uh, and gulf between someone like Carl Schmidt and someone like Mencius Moldenbug or, or Nick Land, but they share, they definitely share the um, the interest in a decision being able to be made to be to be able to be made quickly and um, unquestionably. I just I just give Schmidt, and you realize I'm just just rhetorically going to defend Schmidt yeah. here. Yeah. I I think that Schmidt would be uh, would look down upon sort of 
CEO monarch because the CEO monarch is not looking out for uh, the political order of the state, but is merely looking out for a mercantile um, interest. And so, yes, while maybe Schmidt would concede that, um, okay, this CEO is displayed, he, he gets a little check on the clipboard that he displayed a decisive nature, but to me, uh, Schmidt would ultimately not give that CEO a passing grade, if you will, because the CEO's emphasis on mercantile interests instead of on the uh, overall good of the state by maintaining the political order. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's ins insufficiently culturally conservative, you might say. Yes. <laughs> yes right. uh, can, can I interject? Yeah, please. Oh, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not totally sure about that. Um, I mean, more what I think sort of separates these two, or sort of the, the sort of modern kind of um, neocameral or whatever it is from from Schmidt is more of their idea of simply having a market in sort of state members and into sort of what decisionist or sort of institutions you buy into or don't buy into, into your like sort of legal system. Mm -hmm. um, and whereas, I guess, what, what I understand is the theological component in Schmidt is values that you won't sort of take into consideration for a conversation that when you feel they're threatened, that's when you make the decision, that's when you declare the exception. Uh, mm -hmm. and so those can be democratic values, they can be sort of German racial or cultural values, they can be European liberal secular values threatened by Islam, they can be Sort of, no matter what it is, it can in Islamic societies it can be heresy, or in the church it's heresy, uh, and so that theological component is sort of whatever, whatever the executive or the decision maker feels is threat is sort of the essence of that society and is threatened by it, mm -hmm. and uh, I think, I mean, in comparison to sort of democratic liberalism where. The idea is that anyone can be a part of this society, or, or, or sort of what what you have to accept to buy into this. I think is uh, is very different. Uh, sort of. There's also the if I if I understand neocameralism correctly, it, it, there's also voluntary association, right? Like if yeah, you don't that's... like. If you don't like this, he calls it soft core or something like that. If you don't like this particular soft core, you can go to a different soft core and be ruled by by those people. Exactly, and I mean that's sort of their. I mean, people like uh, Alain de, de Benoist also sort of thinks of this pan-European kind of neo-pagan society that that you basically you stick to your ethnic or theological principles. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and the only difference between someone like Schmidt and someone like um, like Nick Land, per se, mm -hmm. or Moldbug, is yeah, is this free association between states? Mm -hmm. I think, or that that would be, in my opinion, the most important distinction. Yeah. Uh, whereas you okay. can have like the all-white city-state, and if you don't like it because you're not white, you can go somewhere else. But but basically, that whoever is in charge gets to determine the sort of the theological principles of what it means to be subject to this kind of law. Wow. Uh, I, that, and that, I mean, that, that actually Schmidt. reminds me of. Uh, have, have you has has anyone here heard of uh, uh, this concept of? Uh, I read this when I was in my undergrad. Um, a piece called uh, "Panarchy" by mm -hmm. Depoit. Anyone heard of that? No. It's uh, you can find it online. It's just it's just a it's, it's an essay called Panarchy, and the whole idea is it sounds a lot like that. It's 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 uh, panarchy meaning many many uh, archies, many forms of authority, and mm -hmm. uh, and them potentially coexisting um, in a way that is not um, that is not uh, you know not authoritarian between the different uh, archies or archies, um, but but that is. Uh, it may be authoritarian internally. It may be totally anarchist internally. It may be uh, communist. It may be capitalist. It may be all mm -hmm. kinds of things. So um, yeah, that's 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 really interesting. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think I understood that about the voluntary association part. I don't think I understood that part. Mm -hmm. Aaron, I like your comments, but I'm not as well informed on this as you are. So 
So don't take my silence as anything other than what I just articulated. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I just sort of wanted to put a little distance between sort of Schmidt and what we might be talking yeah. about later, but also sort of talk about what might be the opposite. I mean, I think Reza's work and sort of that idea of openness that mm -hmm. that trails through it is sort of this kind of goal of an opposite or, or a kind of... Um, yeah, I mean, it's liberalism has this idea of openness, but only within a certain affordance. Uh, right. And Schmidt, and you, whether whether you talk about him being an authoritarian or defending the Weimar Republic, uh, is saying that there's a theological limit to any sort of openness. In fact, capitalist societies are too open. They allow for too much deterritorialization, and we need to sort of mm -hmm. clamp down on and like stick to our traditionalist theological principles. Uh, right. right, and and oh, by the way, don't interpret any of my comments as suggesting that I would want to be roommates with Carl Schmidt. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Probably be a hor horrible roommate. <laughs> Probably be a horrible roommate. But on the other hand, the bathroom would be clean, I think. <laughs> Maybe. O only, yeah. only, only if he cleans it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, so, so right. I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have a sense that I would agree with Schmidt on many of these sort of uh, theological planks of what he would consider to be a properly ordered society. I just mean to defend that that, uh, and it's largely what Jason has said that he. Uh, I, I, I guess I just want to sharpen the pencil that I think he had a mm -hmm. reverence for order within the state. Although we don't, I think we don't like what he would the sort of population he liked to have within the state, the laws about how the state would be run, but I do give him credit that uh, I think he revered the state and was disdainful of mark mercantile interests if they were not aligned with, um, uh, uh, keep it in mind, the best interests of the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so there's, there's definitely some, some distance there, for sure. Mm -hmm. There's but distance, I mean, and, and, and if you think about, I'll just pick something, uh, the EPA... Um, having the authority to override uh, capitalist interests, let's be optimistic here, capitalist interests in terms of um, maintaining resources, uh, natural resources, you know, I like to think that Schmidt would actually say that the EPA had an appropriate role, for example, because uh, you couldn't let capitalist interests detract from the resources that belong to the order of the state. So it's, that, that's my cautious uh, thesis on that sub-point. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, as as I see this reading, I feel like there is basically two. It's this chapter is kind of divided between two um, two sections, and the, the whole second half I think comes out when he brings up the question of nature, and then he goes through all these different political theories um, in relation to the question the question of of decision making. Uh, and how decision making relates to human nature and what humans generally are like, um, whether humans are uh, primarily good, as he attributes to um, anarchists in particular. Uh, he makes a special point to say that um, that for Rousseau, Rousseau didn't really think that. Uh, in fact, Rousseau um, saw human nature as very malleable. Uh, and that was the whole point of the of the of the of the lawgiver, the legislator, was to was to create the right kind of human nature, at least in the early or in most of Rousseau's career. And then he claims that in the later Rousseau, when he wrote like Emile and things like that, um, he was kind of presenting a version uh, a, perver a, a version of human nature in which human nature is kind of inherently good. Um, and this is also kind of the anarchist perspective. Uh, um, and then the so on the one hand you have the sort of anarchist Rousseauian idea that human nature is primarily good. On the other hand, you have the um, the uh, kind of authoritarian uh, monarchical decisionist fascist perspective, which is that human nature is inherently bad, and therefore you need a um, you need a, a strong uh, sovereign to control human nature um, in the name of the good of everybody. Uh, and then you have the um, then you have the more uh, Marxist perspective, um, which was also Rousseau for most of his writing period, 
in which um, in which human nature is very malleable, and it really depends on the mode of production. So when people say that, um, well, it's just not in human nature to to live in a socialist society. We're not we're not really capable of that. We're we're you know we do need to um, <clears throat> we do need to have a market society because humans are self interested, and that's what they do. Um, Marx would say, well, no, because human nature is you know it depends on on how the economy is set up. It depends on if you live in a socialist society, people's nature will become more socialistic. If you live in a capitalist society, their nature will be changed by that mode of production also. Um, and all of these all of these ideas lead to totally different ways of thinking about how decisions should be made. So um, we'll come back to that, but I just want to make sure that we start off with the, the first um, section of the reading. And... Uh, I guess while I'm going through this, if, if anybody would like to raise anything, just um, or interject or, or bring something up, please please do. Uh, I'll try to speak in a way that is that is open to intervention and, and discussion. And uh, and just as a note, in the future, it won't be so much just me kind of like presenting like this. It'll be you know because we'll have the student presentations and uh, those will be set up explicitly in this Oxford Williams kind of style where. The whole point is is sort of um, dialogue and and uh, qu uh, questioning and um, that sort of thing. So for this first one, while I'm kind of going through this, um, why don't we do it where where kind of all of you guys are sort of in the position that I'll be in later, um, and you can just kind of interrupt me um, and uh, and bring something up whenever it whenever the fancy strikes you. So I'll start off with. Um, the beginning. Um, the first thing that I find interesting in here is uh, the word everlasting. The very first thing he talks about is how um, the German romantics, um, he says the German romantics had, had a penchant for quote unquote everlasting conversation. So, uh, and then he juxtaposes this to um, Catholic political thought, which he says uh, uh, considered quote, considered everlasting conversation a product of a gruesomely treated fantasy. Um, so once again, to me, the first thing that leaps out to me here is the question of time and the question of speed. Um, there's, there's a certain impatience that is kind of implied that, you know, we don't want to constantly just be in this never-ending, I mean, we've all, I think we've all heard this, this statement before about, like, Occupy uh, Wall Street, about, you um, Kind of the left, the idea of participatory democracy, um, um, any types of arguments for horizontalism. Um, the main critique that you usually hear is that horizontalism is based in exactly what Schmidt is critiquing here. Um, a horizontal political structures or participatory political structures, um, nothing really happens. At least, at least if we're talking about a, a social movement that is trying to. Um, change the existing order of things. Um, are they really capable of making that happen if if they're constantly bogged down in these very very long meetings? And you know, it's easy to see some of you know that question. I, I guess <clears throat> it also brings up a question of: Is this just like an aesthetic disinterest in in constantly being in conversation, um, or you know, what is really going on here? Um, but to me, what I what what I think is going on is I think that this is a question of speed, of how quickly something happens versus how long it takes, how quickly a decision gets made versus how long it takes for a decision to get made. And so um, to me, this, this idea that you don't want to be in a, a long, drawn-out decision-making process is really about efficiency, um, and it's, it's also about uh, um, what he calls infallibility. So. Um, the reason why the Pope was important, according to um, the Maestro and Donoso Cortez, is is that the Pope can make a kind of final decision, and you have this infallibility. But there's the other side of it, which is that you don't want to be in something that is quote unquote everlasting. You don't want to be in some long drawn out thing, um, and uh, that 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 that's just not a good way to run things um, in this perspective. So he goes on and he um, quotes uh, Cardinal Newman, um, saying that, uh, and this is where the th theology part of it comes in. Um, and he, he's constantly juxtaposing throughout this 
what he calls uh, atheist socialism versus um, versus uh, uh, Catholic um, monarchism, I guess, and um, says that uh, uh, Cardinal Newman thought that um, you know atheism was indecisive, uh, that it was always kind of stuck in in between the either or. Uh, when it should really just decide which is which, and you know, come down on one or one side or the other clearly. Um, and uh, Schmidt kind of, you know, idealizes the Restoration. Um, talks about how it uh, you know, reacted against the French Revolution, um, and then he brings in um, the three main figures, which is Bonald, De Maistre, and Dinosa Cortez, and. Uh, um, prefers these because they put um, uh, tradition above all other things and um, they see tradition as uh, support for um, people who are it's you know this belief that humans are not very capable intellectually uh, except for like certain outstanding individuals but most people are um, not really capable or not very capable and therefore they need somebody to sort of tell them what the truth is and and all of that um, and so for Schmidt, the idea of an either or was is 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 actually a very good thing. It's not something that you want to deconstruct. It's something that you want somebody to be able to make a decision about. Uh, so you have things like God and the devil, good and evil, and all of that. Um, and then uh, when he's talking about De Maistre, he says um, that uh, De Maistre in particular um, emphasized uh, the concept of of decision. Of, of a clear decision um, in the way that this plays into the state um, through sovereignty. So, um, but the really important thing for De Maestro is that is that on the one hand you have the state making a decision, um, making a clear decision, but you also have the state being backed up by the church because the church is you know the quote unquote last decision. The the church the church's decision making is infallible. It's "quote unquote" the decision that cannot be appealed. So, if you if you're interested in this, Roma, yeah, Roma locuta est non disputandum est. So, Roma's spoken. Uh huh. So yes. you know that that is the final authority, mm -hmm. Roma locuta est, and and that's the end of the discussion. So you know to get back to Cortez, yeah, um, a lot of his uh, theory is based on. Aquinas and the Soma and natural law theory, which was very, which is the core, even still to a great extent of, of Catholic mm -hmm. uh, political and social thought. Mm -hmm. So when we get back to 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 Cortes and the state and the sovereignty of the state as a God-given institution, that's that's where we now see this reflected in the. Corporation and the board of directors, basically paralleling the CEO and you know the the, the Pope and the College of Cardinals. Mm -hmm. So I mean the, these are the sort of things that are still carrying on with the hierarchical structures in our time and decision making. You know where you have, for example, mayors uh, uh, imposing a. Uh, on a community um, mm -hmm. in, in unrest. So the, this sort of um, decision making by a sovereign, be it a mayor or a pope or a monarch or a CEO, still has its basis in natural law theory mm -hmm. uh, that, that has been inherited from Aquinas. I don't know, those are just yeah. some thoughts that can to mind while listening to this discussion. How what is the what is it about natural law theory that that ha, that that retains this um, decisionist element? You think um, this formulation, and I don't have the text in front of me right now, but from what I recall, and also Evola was uh, very strongly influenced by these sort of traditionalist structures. Um, Aquinas attributes the uh, monarchist type of thinking to a God-given order, a natural right. law. So the whole natural law 
it is something implicit and uh, and observable in the universe, at least mm -hmm. according to that sort of uh, uh, line of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's something that uh, Der uh, Jacques Derrida deconstructs in um, in the Declaration of Independence. You know, he he talks about uh, when when Jefferson invokes um, the uh, you know he says. Uh, they're, you know, the, these colonies are and by right ought to be free and independent states. Where, where does where does that original authorization come from? If you say that they are, you know, but they're not free and independent states. So, so to say that they are is you're kind of invoking something beyond just the material world, right? You're you're, you're invoking some right. sort of more, right. more more divine thing or or something. Um, yeah. and, by uh, right. 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 I mean, the co the entire concept of, of, of right. I mean, this is something mm -hmm. of a divine origin, which is something that 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 in our current civilization we do not want to acknowledge. Nevertheless, the entire concept of right is something that has its origins with uh, 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 nobility and their claim to having a divine authority to these rights. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Right, but then I mean it's interesting because then you know uh, because actually you know Martin Luther King used the exact same type of uh, logic when you know suggesting that um, you know making the exact same type of argument that that uh, African Americans are are and by right ought to be free. Um, I can't give you the direct quote on where he did that, but it's but he he basically did almost exactly the same thing in the sense that <clears throat> that you know before. Before something is even the case, it can still be claimed and then um, and then fought for. But hmm. but yeah, there's definitely some sort of divine element there. I think. I don't think I, I, Schmidt himself is that. Uh, well, I, I guess I'm thinking of Nomos here, where appropriation, the mm -hmm. land appropriation, is the ground for all following law. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he's very open about the fact that rights are claimed and won only through violence, only through seizing them, and then only after that sort of initial decision can you can you make a sphere of law to separate the exception from. Uh, mm -hmm. He's sort of very Hobbesian in that way. Can I just point out there's a different kind I guess of argument would... in discuss. No, please go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, People are talking about like the, the idea of there being a divine argument or like the kind of deus ex machina, like the right comes from the pure outside. But in, in the way he talks about uh, de maestra, the, the argument is making a decision is more important than how a decision is made because mm -hmm. making a decision is inherent in the mere existence of governmental authority. So it's sort of like a, it's a definition. Like in order to have an authority, there has to be a decision. So the making of a decision is more important than how the decision is made. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're kind of taking a kind of a straw person approach to this. Like this, this same basic issue comes up in all the leftist organizing I've ever been involved in. So, like for example, during the during the strike I was involved in, it was always a major issue. The, the meetings going on forever it was a capacity issue, it was an accessibility issue. People with mm -hmm. kids, people with various, you know, like uh, like lacking the same cap capacities as, as other folk wouldn't be able to be included in the decision because the decision making went on. Uh, forever, or I'm involved in like various boards of directors or cooperatives, and it, in, that, in that case, like it's sort of, I mean, you could go back to I would take it back to Aristotle and say like in the notion of phronesis or like practical decision making. One of the things you have to decide is how, like, what should the temporality of making the decision be, and the argument here is just that it shouldn't be one of eternity. There should, mm. You should come to a decision, or you could think like in Rousseau, there's sort of the same argument, right? Like the mm. idiot, like. The idea that uh, the the proportion of voting among the citizens to decide on the general will should depend on kind of the neat, the the how expressed like how quickly a decision needs. To be made. So I, I yeah I'm, yeah so you know, I, that's what I think. At, at, at something of a banal uh, uh, sort of empirical level, you know every court 
and let's just talk about the U.S. Supreme Court that theoretically is acting as, as something of the sovereign at various times. They impose very strict, rigid, uh, and well-publicized uh, timelines to allow different people to articulate arguments. And these are arguments that at times uh, theoretically would frequently touch on nationwide issues, issues that affect a great many of his day-to-day -day lives, and yet at a pedestrian level, this attorney, that attorney, are given a limited amount of time that they can speak. So you might say that the Supreme Court is very Schmittian in this respect. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess. Um, I, I find sort of that question fascinating, but I think he's saying more than that. I think he's saying that there are some things that are simply not up for discussion. Well, I agree with that. I was. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't mean that that is. There's no remainder to what I said. It's just an observation that mm -hmm. how well we've implemented that part of uh, Schmidt sort of approach to things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, wow. Schmidt is the one doing the straw personing by by constructing his argument for a lack of accountability as against uh, this 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 idea of everlasting conversation. So. If, if the alternative is no decisions ever get made and all conversations go on forever, you're obviously going to be able to argue for a position of, you know, like of no accountability and like a unappealable decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and there's a, and, and there there is an interesting thing there um, in in that I mean he's defending decisionism, but there there's also a, feti a fetishization of the decision itself. On the part of, uh, I guess, radical democratic structures like Occupy, um, because they because they're you know they also care that a decision is made and they're also centrally concerned about how it's made. Although no, actually no, it's the opposite, right? It's the opposite, but in some ways it's not the opposite, you know, because they're they're very concerned with how the decision is made. But they're not concerned with the content of the decision per se. But a decision needs to be made. If no decision is right. made, the sovereign body of the occupation will be dissolved and people will go back their own ways and well, that's what happens, right? Right. Right. That sort of goes back to, like it's in the, in the Hobbes reading, the idea that if people coming together don't decide to, I mean they're talking about voting in a sovereign, but if they don't decide to go with what the majority says, then they shouldn't have bothered showing up because it was a waste of time. <laughs> right. Think, that just reminded me of what of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I know, I, I guess this is more of a question that I'm hoping someone can fill in, but um, I know Schmidt was a legal theorist, his background was in constitutional law, uh, and I wonder how much, I guess I'm thinking of this question of, of discussion and the temporality of discussion in terms of sort of pre and post constitution. Uh, I mean, in terms of the church, the church has doctrines. Those doctrines are infallible. Someone like Cortez or de Maestro would be terrified by whatever Vatican II or, or whatever that is, saying that that the bread doesn't really transubstantiate or whatever church reforms. Uh, but yeah, what were Schmidt's not only opinions but sort of practical actions? And I know he was trying to save the Weimar Constitution in some respects. Um, mm -hmm. And the Weimar Constitution was never suspended until the end of the Second World War. Uh, right. So yeah, how would you talk about the sort of authoritarian decisionism in terms of a constitutional order, or what what limits are there to questioning or changing the constitutional order once it's established? I think is is the question that this kind of brings up, and he says there should be very strict ones. I think, but. Yeah, well, I I think that he says that um, he he says what what matters is not is not the content of the decision, but the fact that a decision is made. Um, I would say that Occupy and various other kind of uh, participatory democratic perspectives would also say it doesn't matter the content of the decision doesn't matter that much either. It's how the decision is made. But I I I'm going to venture and and I I think I'm getting to Aaron's question. I'm going to venture the point of view that I think Schmidt did care about uh, the content of the decision in the sense that, as Aaron articulated, he, do, he did want to say the republic, and, and he saw delay, deliberation, his, 
it as, as yeah, right, let's call it his straw man characterization of endless debate. To me, it was because he did feel that there was a need to preserve the order of the republic, and that he felt the republic is very threatened. So, so I, I take a I take a mildly different point of view. I do think he did he cared about the content of the decision. I think it was not merely uh, the mechanics of the decision. Mm. No, that's yeah, that's a good point because otherwise, why why are you uh, wh wh if if you don't care about the content of the decision, then why are you um, focusing on the Catholic theological background and uh, why is why is that so so crucial? And clearly for him, that that is crucial. So um, and that's well, why you that's why you need decisionism. It's sort of a hierarchy of needs, right? Like you, you first, if you don't have any decision, then you don't have any government or any authority to discuss at all. But after mm -hmm. you have a way of making decisions, then you can start to care about the way decisions are made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I I like to think that Schmidt would um, launch a vitriolic against the filibuster approach. <laughs> <laughs> to the extent Probably. that, yeah, I mean, I say it to be funny, but also to the extent that it forestalls making a decision that, if, if he felt a decision had to be made, it seemed he would be very critical of the filibuster as interfering with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's th this quote here it must be decided without delay. Um, there can be no error because there's no review of the decisions, and the infallibility means that that uh, it's decided without delay. Um, well, what about the nature side of it? Because I feel like this is the whole <clears throat> this is the whole kind of second half of this chapter, and kind of the most the most uh, interesting to me is the way that he the way that he sees he sees um, strange sort of um, relationships between. Seemingly totally opposed um, philosophies, such as um, anarchism and and monarchism, um, and uh, I think that some of, some of the people in the um, Nick Land and Mencius Moldbug sphere refer them re refer to themselves as uh, an anarcho uh, papists, which is kind of interesting. But um, so he starts off in in uh, referring to nature. He says. Uh, that nature is the central question um, between the uh, intensity of commitment to, to decisionism, which he saw as uh, he starts to kind of divide up the various thinkers that we're looking at here, such as Cortez. He says that um, um, in Cortez, uh, there, there's a, a much stronger commitment to uh, to the question of decisionism because precisely because Cortez had a much darker uh, Vision of what human nature is compared to um, De Maestra, uh, where you know he kind of says that De Maestra sort of thought that um, humans were you know had these wicked or evil tendencies, but uh, for Denise, for Denosa Cortez, uh, humans are are you know fundamentally um, depraved, and uh, and and they don't have tendencies. That's that's what they are, um, and. Uh, so then he juxtaposes this to uh, rationalism, uh, and rationalists, you know, he kind of says that there's that there's still a kind of despotism in rationalism. It's just a sort of uh, pedagogical despotism. So he brings up um, Rousseau's lawgiver, um, who would quote unquote change the nature of man, uh, or he brings up um, Karl Marx saying that um, creating a different mode of production will will be kind of pedagogical in a sense because that will change, that will make people see that, you know, they don't only have to be self-serving um, and, that, and that there are other parts to their nature that are, that are kind of suppressed or not even available to, to be developed in the first place um, under a capitalist mode of production. And then he moves on to anarchists saying that um, anarchists assume that human nature is good uh, Rousseau assumes this later in life, um, and uh, that Denoso Cortez was more radical than De Maestro because he uh, emphasizes original sin, um, and uh, and the important distinction here between between I guess the Catholic and the Lutheran Protestant version is that um, he doesn't just he doesn't just justify the state um, simply. On the basis of the nature of man, but also 
um, and its relation to the state, but also the church and um, and uh, and what his own view of what human nature is. Um, there's a quote here that I that is that is really kind of intense that might be interesting to think about, where he says that um, he says De Maestro was shocked by the evil of man. In other words, De Maestro was sort of expecting um, humans to be uh, to be you know maybe you know somewhere in between in a spectrum of of good and evil, uh, whereas Denoso Cortez basically assumed it, and he says, "quote." The outbursts of Denoso Cortez, whose contempt for man knew no limits, man's blind reason, his weak will, and the ridiculous vitality of his carnal longings appeared to him so pitiable that all words in every human language do not suffice to express the complete lowness of this creature. Had God not become man, the reptile that my foot tramples would have been less contemptuous than a human being. So, if you have that uh, dark of a, of a view of what humans are, then... Um, that becomes a basis for you know for for authoritarian structures so as to keep those things in check um, and uh, this next part really made me think of Ranciere and uh, Ranciere's theory of, of pedagogy actually um, because he says that uh, that one of one fundamental basis of decisionism is this belief in the kind of the stupidity of the masses and I find that interesting because we hear that a lot in, you know, we hear that a lot in supposedly kind of um, critical discourse and like left and progressive perspectives also where there's a, there's kind of an assumption that most people are just, you know, I guess it's a sort of cynical perspective, but that most people are just like, you know, brainwashed and sort of incapable. You can see that um, even in, you know, like situationist thought, uh, this idea of the spectacle that people are kind of mesmerized by a spectacle and uh, <clears throat> kind of recuperated and brought into it and unable to see anything um, very clearly. Whereas with Ranciere, Ranciere starts from the assumption of an equality of intelligences and a, a quality of capacity and ends up in very different places, obviously, um, as a result of that. But, yeah, I found that part very interesting. Um, and, but the, the thing that really stands out to me here the most in the second section is how he he sees anarchism as um, he sees anarchism as the as 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 the mirror opposite of decisionism but all, almost as uh, very similar to it at the, at the same time um, no Russian anarchist in asserting that quote unquote man is good expressed a greater degree of elementary conviction than the Spanish Catholic who said, uh, since God has not said it to him, whence, whence does he know that he is good? So, so, the, so the, the idea that humans are inherently bad and the idea that humans are inherently good produces like the exact opposite perspective on how decisions should be made. So I think uh, with Zanetta Rastani's recent text in, in Eflux, The Labor of the Inhuman, advances mm -hmm. like a very extreme rationalist version mm -hmm. of the same kind of claim. Uh, oh. Or, or uh, I mean, not the same kind of claim, but but of this sort of figuring of what, what the relationship of politics to sort of an idea of of human nature or, or human capacities could be. I mean, any kind of uh, enlightenment derived political philosophy has this kind of pedagogical element to it, or it, I mean, it has to treat a political subject as a rationally bound subject. Uh, and therefore, anything is open to question. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's sort of the essential difference between an Enlightenment perspective and this counter-Enlightenment perspective, which is saying that there are things that are simply not up for discussion in a political order, and whether it's, if you don't like it, we'll excommunicate you, or if you don't like it, go pick right. another, go find another political order to join. Um, yeah. That's sort of the difference between a traditionalist religious monarchy or empire and the sort of modern anarcho-papist patchwork, if you want to put it that way, is yeah. whether you have that option to, 
to leave or not. Uh, but but otherwise, I, I think the sort of the distinction can be broken down pretty evenly into those two schools. And it's interesting that anarchism winds up not on the mm -hmm. on the side of of trying to sort of better um, improve people, or I mean, it's that everyone's capable of a of being a rational subject, and would simply let them figure yeah. out. I don't know. It, in this division, it, it it sorts seems to come up in a sort of untenable way. Yeah, and and at the very end, he does. Um, one thing I notice he does several <laughs> times is he's constantly uh, uh, he's constantly in, invoking despotism, and basically saying that everybody is somewhat despotical. Like he's saying that, um, like he's he's saying. Like at the end, he says that uh, Bakunin ends up the the dictator the dictator of an anti dictatorship. He ends up the anti theologian of or, or, or the theologian of anti theology, and that um, and that the pedagogues are all kind of uh, pedagogical dictators. Um, and you know you could you could imagine an anarchist saying that same thing, but at the same time, it's you know. Uh, at the same time, what 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 he's trying to say there, I think, is that is that there is no outside to to authority, I guess, or there's no outside to to this type of type of thing. But yeah. Um, well, yeah, please go ahead. To be reflexive. And say, say again. That it's impossible. Or anything except for a sort of master-slave relationship to exist between somebody in authority and somebody being authored. Right. I mean, part of it makes me think of Foucault. You know, where Foucault says that there is no outside to power relations. You know, the typical yeah. usual anarchist perspective is that you want to get outside of power, you want to oppose power and overthrow it. Whereas with Foucault, he's saying there there is always there always is power. The question isn't. To overthrow power, the question is to um, create better relations of power that are more, you know, I guess hopefully more egalitarian. But um, sure. for Foucault, like power is multi, power is multivocal. Power can mean power doesn't mean a single thing, right? Whereas for, right. for Schmidt, power is pretty, you know, power to do X, like power to to, to impose ends. Uh, right. Yeah. The, the person that makes me think of is Friere, and and to think that. Uh, like, like I sort of, I sort of am sort of with him on the the kind of equivocation between the extreme right and the extreme left. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's a cop out to say that the pedagogues are just pedagogical. Um, yeah. Uh, dictators. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's sort of the dictatorship of the proletariat, and and Marx, in my opinion, is is like playing that pedagogical role to. To move society to a point where it can be successfully communist, where everyone can sort of partic participate rationally in communism rather than simply following class interests. Uh, I mean, in Russia, the problem was that there was no proletariat, and so they simply had to had to make one by assassinating eighty percent, the sort of eighty percent agrarian sector of the population and transforming them into into an industrial style proletariat which clearly didn't work but um, yeah I, I think Marxism also has that, that pedagogical role and that's that's how I interpret dictatorship of the proletariat um, I would just say there's a lot more to the pedagogue than, than a kind of hard Marxism yeah Like in a sense, like any attempt to build any kind of accountable institution, like a cooperative institution or any kind of social justice enterprise, it is an attempt to kind of uh, reflexively engage that that power relation so that the accountability relationships don't only run in one direction. And as soon, as soon as you have the idea that like the person in charge could be accountable to the people who they're in charge of, like you have the undermining of this kind of uh, this kind of extremism. I think. Mm -hmm. I think. I think the relation in which it is. I, I, the question is whether that is or isn't instinctively hierarchical, and I think the question also comes down to exit once again, 
whether that's a relationship that you're stuck in because you're stuck in it, or if you don't like this teacher, you can leave and find a new teacher, find a new institution. I mean, I think that would be the response there. Uh, if it's a relationship you can't get out of, then it's certainly a hierarchical relationship. Um, Right. In in certain in certain types of thinking. Uh, I don't know, are you familiar with uh, A.O. Hirschman's Voice Exit? I'll just let the whole title. It's voice Exit. Um, but it's a theory of institutions that, I don't know, pretty much sums up a, a more liberal idea of what what political participation is like, or participation in any kind of institution. You have the options to to voice your complaints and hope they're taken up, mm -hmm. participate them, or, or simply to leave. Uh, I don't know, it's a major sociological tax in theory of institutions. Yeah. Institutions can also be challenged from the inside, right? So especially like in, in 19th century France, there were various very insurrectionary uh, events which held institutions accountable, like violent insurrections. And they went pretty successfully, at least until the commune. And so uh, there, there are definitely other other means that people hold institutions accountable other than just the kind of like stay in a dominating relationship or leave. Right? It, 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 it's also... Uh, I mean, no, you, I mean, you would, you would say that that's a form of voice, with, whether it's a form of voice that sort of goes outside the state and and breaks the law or not, it's still a, a form of voice. Uh, sure. I don't know. So I, 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 put the, uh, I put the Panarchy reading here on the side. <clears throat> that might be interesting in thinking about the uh, voluntary association aspects of neocameralism. Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, we're, we're getting... Uh, pretty close to the end. Um, we've pretty much gone through the basic elements of this. Um, does anybody, anybody have any... Monarchy? Yeah, uh, talk about what? The July monarchy. The July monarchy. Yeah, it's sort of like the... In, in my reading, it's sort of like the key argument in the last section of the, mm. of the read. Sure, sure. <laughs> This idea that the uh, that the liberal bourgeoisie is um, what does it call them a discussing class because they want to keep the king but they don't want the king to have any power hmm. and they're sort oh, of yeah. like pushed on both one hand by hating the aristocracy on the other hand by being afraid of the of the power. and and it, it, this for Schmidt is a kind of inauthenticity or a, a hypocrisy yeah. Like, although the liberal bourgeoisie wanted a, wanted a god, its god could not become active. It wanted a monarch, but he had to be powerless. It demanded freedom and equality, mm -hmm. but limited voting rights to the property classes. Yeah, that 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 list of uh, that list of um, it's it's almost like uh, you know when when Jefferson it almost reads like a response to Jefferson's list of you know when he's talking about the king and the Declaration of Independence uh, of England. You know, he has, he has, he has, he has, he has done these things. And uh, now this is sort of like the monarchy coming back and saying, well, the, that may be true, but the liberal bourgeoisie has done this, has done this, has done this, has done this. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting list. One of, the, one of the god, but its god could not become active. One of the monarch, but he had to be powerless. It demanded freedom and equality but limited voting rights to the property classes in order to ensure the influence of education and property on legislation, as if education and property entitled that class to repress the poor and then educated it, abolished the aristocracy of blood and family, but permitted the impudent rule of the moneyed aristocracy, the most ignorant and the most ordinary form of, of an aristocracy. It wanted neither the sovereignty of the king nor that of the people. Which is really, really interesting, and it makes perfect sense why he. I mean, he later he talks about uh, Cortez and Bakunin, and uh, basically says that you know, um, Bakunin and the anarchists are the only ones who um, who who are worthy of really 
talking about at this point. They're the only ones who are really the who who really truly challenge um, decisionism because uh, because uh, liberal democracy just does not um, address these basic issues. So, and it's kind of true if you think about it. If you look at um, not necessarily, I'm not arguing this in favor of, of anarchism, but if you look at you know the resurgence of uh, kind of hard right politics in Europe and a lot of other places, um, a lot of it is happening in the face of uh, the economic crisis that's arguably still going on, and you know people want answers. They want to know why, um, you know why why they are uh, you know losing their um, kind of middle class um, status that that is typical of whoever is supposed to be considered a, a quote-unquote citizen subject. And, uh, and as a result of that, you know, you're either going to go in the direction, you're either going to go in the kind of Schmidtian direction of, of um, the established order, or you're going to go in the direction of socialism and anarchism. Well, I mean, th that's what Schmidt wants you to think, right? Yeah. That's what Schmidt throws out when he's making fun of the July monarchy here is Hegel. Right? Mm -hmm. So, like, Hegel and, like, yeah. the philosophy of right, this is Hegel's theory of the monarch, right? The, the monarch mm -hmm. has to be a sort of figurehead who just stamps things. But, uh, but all of the decision-making needs to be instituted in a kind of internally accountable bureaucracy. And then to yeah. connect that to the political scheme, like, these right-wing uh, movements are, like, coming into play as, like, the sort of, like, uh, bureaucratic uh, social democracies, bureaucratic welfare states are receding. Mm -hmm. so, like, as the state is no longer able to, like, kind of through this internal mechanisms meet people's needs, that, like, that um, new populist leaders are emerging. Mm -hmm. like, like, I think Hegel is sort of like the, the attempt to think liberalism seriously in a way that avoids democratic populism. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, all Schmidt is willing to engage with is like right-wing populism and left-wing populism. Right. So we should just be, we should be careful not to, not to accept uh, uh, Schmidt's sort of making fun of, of liberals as hypocritical. Like the, the other way of interpreting this hypocrisy is like attempting to negotiate a tension, which mm -hmm. if you fall on either side of, you end up a kind of fascist. Right. Right. And he, he he does address Marx and Marxism, but not not very not very much. And and, and that that kind of uh, you know quietude or or whatever in relation to Marx and Marxism, um, as opposed to anarchism, you know, does raise some questions. I would think. You know about about why why does he do that? Why is it primarily just dictatorship, anarchism, and liberalism? So is Cortez a Hegelian? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think he is. No, I think he's saying that he's not a Hegelian. Well, maybe Stahl is a Hegelian. He says he was horrified by Hegelian thinking. Yeah. Oh no, never mind. He's just calling Mark the Mark the Hegelian. Yeah. No, it's fine. Does anyone have any thoughts on on why he why he is so quiet about Marxism and so loud about anarchism? He, he kind of equates Marx with um, the the with the uh, pedagogical dictator and with um, Rousseau to some extent, but doesn't really say that doesn't really say that much about it. Yeah, I guess he does when he says atheist socialism. I mean, I think he's simply rejecting the Enlightenment idea of the state uh -huh. as as a view that could only come from from already within an established state, and that basically ignores the fact that the exception is always there before the rule. It's the foundation of the rule, and mm -hmm. and can't really be done away with. Right, and so. I think he's sort of stripping, stripping down theory of government back to to what he thinks is its essence. But he's also saying that 
because we've sort of forgotten this this essence of governing authority, we've allowed tradition and and authority to degrade. And so, in order to to preserve authority and prevent sort of the Enlightenment's attack on on everything solid, uh, we need to go back to this sort of essence of what government is, mm -hmm. which is that mm -hmm. there are some things that you can't bring up for questioning. Uh, yeah. That the that power is not accountable to anything but power itself. Mm -hmm. I, I I I like your comments, Aaron. I'm I'm I I'm not prepared to address this today, but in, in Schmidt's book on on dictators, on mm -hmm. dictatorship, he talks some about this subtopic, and and I'm going to go back and sort of refresh my memory on the text, and and I um I, I I'm, I'll get into this, I'll bring this up another time, because I think this is a really interesting topic, is does he think of the, of the exception as a separate concept, or merely as a deficiency in sort of the, the human limitations on legislative making? I, I do think he addresses that in, in his dictatorship book, so I, I just kind of want to put a placeholder. I think it's an interesting topic to take up, and I'll look at this again so I can bring that to the group next time. Great, thank you. Does, does anyone find, uh, I actually posted one of these quotes where he's juxtaposing um, uh, anarchism and, and uh, decisionism on my Facebook, and um, it was this one towards the very end where he says, um, he says, uh, this is where he invokes Bakunin again <clears throat> in anarchism. He says, uh, De Maestro said that every government is necessarily absolute, and an anarchist says the same. But with the aid of but with the aid of his axiom of the good man and the corrupt government, the latter draws the opposite practical conclusion, namely that all governments must be opposed for the reason that every government is a dictatorship. Every claim of a decision must be evil for the anarchists because the right emerges by itself in the imminence of life. Uh, the, the right emerges by itself in the, if the imminence of life is not disturbed by such claims. This radical antithesis forces him, of course, to decide against the decision. And this results in the odd paradox whereby Bakunin, the greatest anarchist of the 19th century, had to become, in theory, the theologian of the anti-theological, and in practice, the dictator of an anti-dictatorship. Do you think that these are? Do you think that there's any validity to what he's saying here? Do you think that this is? Um, I mean, I, I got two comments in a row that basically said, um, "No, that's that's not that's not right." He's just being rhetorical and um, and that kind of thing. I think it's polemic. Like I, I think yeah. the whole article is sort of it's sort of ridiculous, right? It starts off by saying that mm -hmm. oh, uh, either or claims has to be yeah. either this way or that way. That is uh, the opposite. Oh, did you? But uh, sorry, but 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 in reality, it's not the opposite discussion. Like like posing things kind of metaphysically in terms of whether we're like fundamentally good and fundamentally evil, that actually guarantees the discussion will go on forever and there's no resolution to the discussion. Yeah. So like I, I think he sort of like takes on Bakunin as sort of an ally in, in setting up the game so that he has to he has to win. And like yeah, and he sidelines Marx and Rousseau as as like the less serious enemies because they're actually more dangerous to him, right? It's more dangerous to him that people might be, you know, good some of the time and bad some of the time rather than because if you have to pick, right? If you have to pick, humans are either always good or always evil. It's safer to pick always evil because they're evil some of the time. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, he he might he might, he might see the Marx and Rousseau version as somewhat similar to um, somewhat similar to liberalism in that it doesn't clearly state what what humans are, and f for his view of of how decisions ought to be made, you you do need to clearly you do need to clearly come down on one side or the other, and not not uh, say that you know, well, not say well it depends, you know. Or, or like maybe that makes you more accountable, right? So like I'm involved in uh, one of the things I'm involved in is I'm a member of the board of directors of Cooperative, and uh -huh. our meetings. Like, if we aren't prepared for our meetings, we're not going to make good decisions. Decisions or decisions aren't going to be made in a timely way. Like mm -hmm. if we don't. We don't read the relevant documents beforehand. If we don't like, treat each other with respect, 
Like, mm-hmm. there's a lot of contingency, right? Like, we, we could do a bad job, but we could yeah. also do a good job. And, like, well, what do we do? Well, we try to hold each other accountable. Right? Yeah. Now, just that, like, oh, well, the meeting went badly because humans are fundamentally evil. It's a, it's a, to, me it's, <laughs> to me, it's a cop-out, and it's a cop-out that sort of, like, takes the responsibility. It, it, it's a way of eschewing the responsibility, even from the authority position. Right. Because right. even if, say, you're the chair of the board, so it's your responsibility, or the corporate sector is your responsibility to make sure that people are, like, keeping up on things. Well, it's your responsibility to do that. And just to say, oh, people are shit, like, it, it, it's a way of, um, of, of, of blaming somebody else when it's actually, to some extent, your responsibility. Mm-hmm. Right, and, and, and if, you, if you do take the anarchist perspective and you think that humans are primarily or inherently good, uh, and then you go and you get involved in activist work or, or, or a board or a cooperative or whatever, and you discover that people can be pretty nasty, um, you know, precisely because you have such a such a, a firm view of what human nature is, you may actually end up uh, taking a turn to the right because you just had a kind of simplistic view of, of what humans are like. <laughs> you know, um, and, and and that could be that could be really problematic. But yeah. But no, I mean, it does kind of remind me of people like um, Peter Hallward, uh, Peter Hallward's book, um, Absolutely Postcolonial, where he says that, you know, uh, the problem with postcolonialism is that it's too ambiguous, and it doesn't really, you know, if you really want, like, a strong anti-colonial politics, you, you, you can't really have ambiguity as part of the framework. You need to really, um, you need to really be able to say, uh, no, we want, you know, we really do want to fully decolonize, and we don't we don't respect this um, anything about the about the colonizer. Whereas postcolonial theory would say uh, would would say you know that uh, not everything that came from colonialism was inherently bad, um, and some of it might be retained uh, is a little more ambiguous. But yeah, it, I don't know. I'm on the side of ambiguity myself, so. Any 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 last thoughts, Harry? Or Bruce? Oh uh, no, nothing nothing from me right now. Okay. Um, uh, thanks. No, I I I've enjoyed this conversation. I've enjoyed uh, these latter part of the comments, but I don't have something to add to that myself. Okay. Oh, it looks like Carlos just came back. There is a quote I want to highlight. I'm trying to see if I can paste it. I'll read it off. It's, Today, nothing is more modern than the onslaught against the political. American financiers, industrial technicians marked as socialists, anarchists, cynicalists, revolutionaries unite in demanding that the biased role of politics over unbiased economic management be done away with. Mm-hmm. There must no longer be political problems, only organizational, technical, and economic sociological tasks. Mm-hmm. I mean, this this seems totally relevant, yeah. uh, and is yeah. really strikingly similar to someone like Zizek's criticisms of liberal democracy and, and the way ideology sort of reduces things to to non-political. Yeah, just man like government being through the best management, uh, and that that basically any kind of enlightenment or rationalist idea of of political philosophy sort of falls into this trap or according to Schmidt is not really political. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know, dude. That, right, that's like, a very strong and striking claim. I mean, especially... Yeah, it, 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 and it's interesting because, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, I mean, a lot of critical theory <clears throat> kind of represents, I guess, the sort of bureaucratic uh, managerialism <laughs> of, of kind of modern liberal democracy Represents that as being um, very much like a dictatorship, right? But here is here is the partisan of dictatorship saying, uh, saying no, that's not like what I'm arguing for at all. In fact, I agree with you that that's a problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, that, I I did find that interesting too. I'd I'd want to go back to it and think about it a little bit more. What what, what do you think is um what do you what do you think is the significance of that? Why do you think that that kind of resonates in a way? Um, 
Well, I mean, I think it really draws the line that that we've sort of been commenting on that's very strange, where anarchists and theological Catholics are, you know, mm-hmm. on, on one side and the liberal bourgeois democracies and Marxist communism is on the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the question, I guess, is either what, what the nature of the human is and what the nature of the political is mm-hmm. also. Uh, or these, I guess we could call them the romantics on, on the Schmidt and anarchist side. Mm-hmm. Politics is is about this sort of inviolable essence. You could call it the human condition or you could call it theological revelation. Whereas on the other side, it's more an argument about what the best way to manage bodies is. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could say even with a sort of rationalist, transhumanist perspective on politics, where if people are in their natures not really capable of self-government, we should work to make them that way, whether it's through through education, through Marxist reorganization of production, or through body modification and creation of proper institutions sort of modulated with machines for helping us think and manage our affairs so that we can kind of go about our business without violating each other's autonomy. Uh, and I don't know, I, and that could include also non-human rationally capable agents as well, or any kind of agent. Uh, whereas, yeah, I, I'm the Schmidt, I'm the, the sort of romantic vision of politics. Politics is about sort of fighting for your ability to live your mode of life as it is. And the anarchist perspective is sort of the same. It's sort of unmolested by by the corruptions of power and certain social influence. Human beings would be capable of self-government, uh, and so sort of that kind of power needs to be abolished because without it, people would would simply be capable of living their lives. Uh, Carlos raised a question here. He said, uh, I, I think that's at least partially based on the suspicion of the state. Um, he's asking whether we mentioned that earlier. Um, wh- what was that referring to, Carlos? Does anyone remember what that would be referring to? Suspicion of the state. I, I, I think it's referring to uh, the quote that I, I was mentioning earlier where Schmidt is so critical of mercantile interests. I, I, I think it was in the context of Aaron bringing that up uh, again that uh, Carlos wrote that comment. Mm. Oh, okay. Hmm. Right. Can I just say I really like I like Aaron. I really like the way you characterize there between the, the kind of romantics and the, and the pedagogues, um, and I think that's really uh, helpful for our course, especially because of the idea of emergency. So I think that one of the characteristics of politics of emergency is to try to bring the romantic. It's like sometimes it has revolutionary components of like politics, which is about the need for absolute decision the radical overcoming of tension through wholesale dissolutions of existing structures which are perceived as the sources of social conflict uh, into the everyday normal operations of society is basically what I see as uh, the kind of emergence of the police states in mm-hmm. Western the, the normalization of the emergency. I mean, that, that's a gum, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm not I as well. Too, oh, no. The, um, like, there's a time when that kind of politics is appropriate. Like, there is a real emergency. But ma- the no- kind of the normalization of the emergency is, is what we're getting at. Mm-hmm. Right. But more than that, I think, I mean, there are, there are people who are, I mean, people talking about the Anthropocene, radical leftists, anarcho-primitivists, you would also categorize them sort of on the same side as Schmidt here. Uh, that That basically we as a species are incapable of sort of managing this kind of supposedly rationalized capitalistic development and what we need to do is simply stop I mean this is the sort of anti-acceleration as primitivist take on that and I don't I'm not familiar enough with Agamben 
or some of these more sort of theologically inflected types of, of post-communist thinking. But, I mean, you could even put them in that they're appealing to some kind of essence of the human condition or some kind of freedom that we can realize that, that won't be realized through this kind of rational self-questioning. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I, I think there, there could be an argument for putting someone like Agamben That's also on this side. Uh, certainly Heidegger. Uh, yeah. And that kind of right wing. Yeah. Heideggerian. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, he was a student. He was a student of Heidegger. I mean, not a direct student, but he, he you know, he definitely mm -hmm. he, he went to some of Heidegger's lectures and and that sort of thing. And and uh, there's definitely something very Heideggerian about him and kind of quasi mystical, um, in a way that's not that similar to like neo rationalism and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, although, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I agree with you on that. So, but this whole thing doesn't this doesn't this evoke the uh, once again the old Catholic uh, theory of the fallen nature of human of humanity, and that regardless of, the, of their best efforts, that uh, humans will always tend towards uh, uh, their uh, uh, concupiscence or evil or lust or whatever it, it, isn't that really in evoking that again I mean the specific Catholic manifestations of it yeah but I don't know if, if as a rule you need to describe Schmidt that way I don't know if you think so Could could you say it one more time, Harry? Or, or, well, or just like rephrase yeah, it? Yeah, you know, there's there's just to be this of the nature and, and so on that that there's a uh, that there's a an essence or or something in human nature that seems to be incapable of this sort of uh, a. Uh, Monarchist type of decision decisionism, and that that th this whole idea of a flaw in human nature goes all the way, you know, and that that seems to reflect uh, a view that co that comes from uh, Catholicism, or you know, which is basically the essence of uh, Western thinking that human nature is, is by in nature flawed or somehow imperfect and tends towards uh, the, it, that individuals will, will always tend towards their own personal inclinations, lusts, and so forth. Mm -hmm. or, did I, or did I not hear what was being said earlier correctly? Um, I mean, I think that's one one side of this perspective. I mean, I think with Schmidt's theory, you could just as easily found a government upon uh, Agamben's idea of the open or the return to the animal, uh, his kind of praise of monasticism, these being sort of also theological sort of described tenets that, that kind of had this liberatory potential uh, in his work. I don't know. That, that's what I think of as sort of the anarchistic equivalent mm. to that. Okay. Uh, in in a very modern sense. And, espe and especially his more recent work, he's done a lot on on theology in the, mm. in the last, you know, in my opinion, there was like a turn in his writing towards theology um, at the exact moment when his star began to fall, <laughs> mm. in terms, of, in, just in terms of like popularity. Uh, like it, it just makes me wonder, like. What was the reason for for that turn exactly? Was that something that he always um, wanted to do, or did that just happen because because he just was not as um, widely cited at that point? Hmm. I don't know. But all right, well, we're we're at about eight fifteen, so um, let's uh, go ahead and wrap it up. Unless anyone has any last things they want to say. Okay. Um, 
All right, so next week, uh, just to review what we're planning for next week. I, I'm sorry, when you say yeah. next week, you mean Wednesday this I'm week. I'm sorry, right? yeah, Wednesday this week, I'm sorry. All I, right, I, okay. I, I always think of it like that because I, um, I almost always teach... Uh, you know, oh, that that's the reason, because whenever I teach a, a two-and-a-half, three-hour class like this, it's always a once-a-week class. That's the reason. Um, I understand. You know, I'm just such yeah. a liberal, I'm such a literal guy, I'll, I'll get myself <laughs> tied up in a pretzel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, so yeah, on Wednesday, uh, we'll be discussing um, uh, Agamben's State of Exception, and Tristan will be doing that one. Uh, Aaron will be covering um, Critique of Violence from Walter Benjamin, and, uh, and I'll be doing uh, the, the two Julius Ebola readings. Um, and then we have a Gopal Balakrishnan interview. This is where he, he talks a bit about his uh, Schmidt book in this interview. That's the main reason I put it there. And it's just suggested. Nobody has to actually read, read that necessarily. Um, and, uh, and then Bruce will be um, our, our guest uh, speaker um, for, for that meeting. So. And, and this, I just want to clarify, in, in Michigan time, what time does the class start? In Michigan time, it's uh, 5 to 7.30. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, just want to confirm that for myself. That's all. Mm -hmm. Five to oh wait. Five five to seven thirty EST, which is also New York time. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, uh, EST starts uh, about an hour east of Chicago. So huh. okay. That includes yes. Us. Uh, Michigan was central. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, Chicago. The the Chicago is is the central. Yeah. Starts above Wisconsin. Oh, yeah, you could look at it that way too, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> cool. All right, well, I'm going to copy this conversation and I'll put it in the um, in the classroom too, mm -hmm. so everybody has it. And I'll see you all next week. Enjoy it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good guys. evening. Yeah, everyone wants to.